Haha! <laughs> that caught you out. I'm not supposed to be here, but here I am. Um, the reason being is that I got pinged the other day, and uh, I'm now self-isolating. So I couldn't go to my gig, and so I'm stuck here, and you're stuck with me. But never mind, hey, um, we'll, we'll crack on somehow. Um, thanks to, first of all, let me just say thank you to uh, Dominic Hawken, who stood in for me again last week when I was queuing up uh, outside a record store in my local town to buy some records. That apparently is where I came into close contact with uh, not one but two people who have tested positive um, for this awful bug that's going around. Um, luckily, I'm, I'm testing negative all, you know, every day, so um, I think I'm okay, fingers crossed. Um, but yes, um, you know, thanks uh, to Dominic for... Uh, standing in as he does and we are joined as ever uh this week um by ben by chris and our special guest uh jim danica welcome to you all how are you good, good evening good good um let's let's go to jim jim you're in in nashville tennessee mm -hmm. that's a terrible way to introduce somebody in a horrible fake american accent um but the <laughs> the heart of music in america you know you are you know nashville is is such you know the center of the the universe in, in terms of music i guess yeah how is it over there good it's it's funny you say that you know it's always been called music city um mm. for such a long time people still associated it you know, primarily with country music, which was true for, for a long time. Mm. But it has really become kind of a melting pot. There are all kinds of music being made here now, um, which is kind of surprising. But it's it's been that way for 10 or 15 years now. But um, yeah. it, it really is becoming, you know, kind of another L.A. or, or London in a lot of ways. Um, but, yeah, it's fun. It's like I said before we went live, it's hot and humid right now. So yep. um, great barbecue. Great, great food. Lots of good stuff going on, but yeah, we don't want to go outside right now. <laughs> no, it's one of my ambitions to come there. I mean, like you said, I always thought it was like the center of country and western, not just music right. in general. And yeah. then I think it was um, Dave Stewart from the Eurythmics many, many years ago. Yep, kind of went out there and started working out there, and I thought well, that's odd. You know, Dave Stewart. You know, he's right. not a country guy. Yeah, and then you see more and more, you know, names appearing you know mm -hmm. saying oh we were in nashville doing this and nashville doing that and you think well this this place is is clearly yeah. the place to be it's a great spot when you yeah. come over let me know we'll, we'll go have some barbecue we'll do that nice. definitely um let's well, go over to the, the uh, oh, yeah. diversity of it uh one of our friends tim grogan is doing an electronic music concert in the nashville area tonight so all right you know, they're even electronic music oh yes and how is it in california chris is it uh, is it hot still over there it's normal, right? <laughs> it's normal. It's, it's, normal, it's for normal for California. Normal for California. But how are you and yourself okay? Yeah, yeah doing I'm doing well? all right. Uh, yeah, just getting back to things, got the studio back together, and uh, just you know having fun with synthesizers and recording. Yes, because you've decorated. Yeah, it's a different yeah. color. It's a different color. It needed to be a little bit brighter in here, so I yeah, decided to change it up for a looking good. While. It's looking good. It's looking good. Well done. Benjamin Simpson. How yeah, are my, you? Mine's not looking so good. It's looking like a bit of a tip at the minute. I'm, I'm basically <laughs> living in here at the minute because I've got so much to do. You know, we've got, I think we were supposed to be gigging a, a couple of weeks ago and that got cancelled because of the changes over here. Yeah. Uh, but uh, next Friday is our first real gig. So Excellent. Uh, I'm just doing all the final stuff on that. A bit of main stage that I'm sure 
at least one of you well, know a bit about. Yeah, yeah I think uh, Jim Jim will be <laughs> able to answer some of your questions yeah. there. Excellent, good stuff. Well, yes, glad uh, glad to hear that the uh, the live stuff is going ahead. Say, I was I was supposed to be at a gig myself tonight. Um, in the local, uh, you know, the John Peel Centre, um, China Crisis, for those of uh, us old enough to remember them. Um, but unfortunately, you know, got pinged, got to stay at home. And uh, luckily, the venue refunded me. I felt really awful, though, because they, they really need the business. Mm. Um, but, you know, got to do what you got to do. Anyway, welcome one and all. Let's welcome uh, all the people in the chat rooms, whether you're watching us on Facebook or whether you are... Uh, watching us on YouTube, where most people are. Um, thank you to. I'm not going to go through names. You all know who you are. We love you. Thanks for joining us as per usual. Um, just a few and other also, bits of And also a special thanks to Andrew Brooks and Sasquatch, and also uh, Dominic, who are uh, in the chat oh, as yes. mods. We had a <laughs> we had a, a kerfuffle. It was uh, like the Wild gosh. West in here last week, wasn't it? Yeah, but uh, <laughs> I think we won. Yeah. But with uh, with these guys on, will be it'll be much easier. With yeah, like yeah. That. So yeah, thanks for those people who offered to moderate the chat room and kick out any of those nasty little bots that appear. Hopefully, nothing will happen this week. I, you know, I leave the place for one week; it all goes to pot. So <laughs> I, I thought you were responsible, to be honest. Yes, my my name is Gwen Stefani because apparently <laughs> that's what the uh, the bot's name was, which is quite interesting. Anyway, um, let's just go through some of the housekeeping. So, uh, of course, we are uh, on YouTube, as you're most of you are probably watching us right now. But if you're not, you can find us there in the channel. All of the other live shows are stored there, and some of our specials too. Uh, of course, we have the Facebook group, um, which you are more than welcome to join. Please do uh, find us on there. Hit the join button. Answer three questions just to simply prove that, A, you want to be there, and B, that you're human, and we'll let you in. Um, Instagram as well, and, of course, Twitter. Uh, we don't tend to use those as much. I'm, I must make a conscious effort to to do more on Twitter and Instagram. Um, I'm just being told that my microphone's a little bit hot, so let me just take that down a bit. Um, and where else are we? Um, of course, yes, if you want to uh, share our goings on across Facebook, I've told you about this before, but our, our core Facebook group is kind of locked down as a private thing, and there's nothing we can do to unlock it because Facebook won't let us. So we created ProSynth Network Show, and that's a separate page on Facebook, and we put all the links up there. And if you want to share those around amongst your friends and your family and anybody that you might think uh, would have an interest, then please go and join that page. Just like it. It's not a group thing. It's just like a show thing. And we'll post links there, and you can share those around. If you need to email us, of course, uh, info at prosynthnetwork.com. And finally, we just do the little cap in hand here. If you want to donate to the show, uh, and keep us on air because all of this costs money um, then please do there's the address cutley forward slash psn hyphen donate uh, it's a little paypal donation link you can uh, leave us any amount you so wish large or small they are all very very welcome and thank you to everyone so far who has contributed to all of that right um i think we'll what we'll do is we're going to just do what we normally do and crack on with a few kind of discussion topics and then we're going to jump in and talk to jim about his career in the music business the wonderful gear that's all behind him flashing away um backstage pass which is a, a great product that jim's behind uh for particularly for, for live musicians uh working uh with keyboard rigs on main stage and logic and um yeah we'll just kind of do that regular casual thing so let's go to our first news topic. Now we covered this um, a little while back, and this well, I say we covered it. We we talked about its uh, its launch announcement, but then there was no demos, there was no audio, there was just lots of pictures and some spec sheets. But this is finally kind of coming down the pipeline. This is Kurt's files uh, K twenty seven hundred premium high end synthesizer, which has all of the wonderful stuff that the uh, the k-series uh, comes with and then some um, huge amounts of polyphony huge amounts of storage of course it's got the vast synthesis uh, stuff going on in there just uh, an incredible uh, keyboard and 
one of the worst product launches I think I've ever seen. A 45 minute video <laughs> presented uh, from, from Korea because I didn't actually realize that um, Kurzweil had been taken over by a South Korean company many years ago. I just still thought they were based in America. But um, these guys did a like a 40, yeah, 41 minute um, kind of demonstration stroke launch and it was just, just give me the stuff, you know, give me the good stuff. There was lots of talking and lots of, yeah, it's nice to understand this stuff, but um, I think nowadays in the world of social media, I think I've got so used to things being chopped up into little bite-sized nuggets. So I just, if I want to learn about the sequencer, I can just go there. If I want to learn about yeah. the, the synth engine, I can go here and, and yeah, anyway. Um, what are people's thoughts on Kurzweil's K2700? Is, are we still looking for decent workstations? Uh, or are, are we now so much focused on you know single purpose instruments because the workstation was was huge in the 90s and into the early 2000s and then it started to kind of dwindle um although you know most manufacturers you know the big manufacturers korg and roland and yamaha still have premium workstations kurtzweil's always kind of been up there um let's let's talk to our our career gigging musician uh jim what do you think uh, any opinions on the on the kurtzweil are you a kurtzweil user does this appeal to you you know i i have never been much of a workstation guy i, I just mm -hmm. um kind of like you said a minute ago i i think i fall more on the side of single purpose um synths you know where where each in fact i kind of went through selling some stuff lately and i'm still thinking about selling some more i wanted to get down to a point where everything in my studio really really brought something unique to the table and um the one workstation class synth that i still have is the roland phantom the one mm -hmm. you know the new one that came out a year and a half ago and that one i actually really really like but not for the workstation features i just like that it covers so much um territory it's essentially a roland anthology kind of like the the jupiter x but other than that um i'm just I, you know i do everything in logic and so i just don't mm -hmm. have the need for the complexity you know of a workstation keyboard they just don't really appeal to me and i've never i've never actually been a kurzweil guy for, for whatever reason their stuff was just never that appealing to me uh, nothing wrong with it it just mm -hmm. um i've always been you know yamaha or roland at the top of the list for me at korg for in the 90s with the onw the m1 you know yeah. stuff but other than that, I, it, you know, I saw the announcement and I, and I watched about five minutes of the video you talked about. <laughs> and I thought the same thing. I thought that is a bizarre way to, <laughs> to introduce a new product. Yeah. Looks cool, though. I mean, it, it yeah. definitely looks promising. It's just yeah. not my cup of tea. No, no, it, um, it certainly has, you know, like everything in it. It's like, you know, they've thrown literally everything into this thing. Multiple synthesis engines, loads of performance features, loads of sequencing features as well. And I'm, I'm being sort of... Um, uh, told off in the chat room you know it's not just a workstation the synth side is huge and uh, yeah it absolutely is um it's a really impressive uh feature set for sure i i mean i have one workstation and that's an elisis fusion so i guess that's kind of like really left field in the work in the workstation thing i could never get into it i could never i prefer ha having everything on a big screen um to, you know maybe it's because i'm short-sighted but it's um you know it's just not my my thing so yeah, it's a, it's a really odd thing. Um, ben, as a, again, as a live performer, do do workstations of PM? I mean, I know you've got. What have you got? You've got uh, workstation of some description. <laughs> I don't what? think so. No. no. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. I don't. No. No, no. I haven't. Not anymore. Oh yeah, I've, I've got. I, thought you had... I have. I have. Sorry, I've got the uh, the motif and the. That's it. Uh, the Integra Seven. It's because the rack mounted. I didn't. I don't think of them as being works. This is well, no, yeah, I, yeah, I can forgive yeah. you that. Uh, oh, and I've got the Phantom as well, the the, the rack mounted one of them. So I've got three. So no, no, I haven't got any work sessions. Yeah. Oh, actually, no, I've got three. Yeah. <laughs> uh, was it, is the EX five a workstation? Yes. Oh, I've got four then. Um, <laughs> I, I, I haven't got any more though. Really. Okay, you sure about yeah. that? Okay, yeah. all right. Anyway, any your thoughts but, on the Kurzweil. I, I totally agreed with what what Jim was saying. Really, like, like, like weirdly so. It was like everything he was saying. I, I, I was like, yeah, that's spot on. That's spot on. And yeah. I think that's not a coincidence. It's just the way that the majority of us are now. It's like we we don't really need an all in one 
keyboard solution for, for that thing. We we are we're treating the whole studio as a modular rig, really, and we've yeah. got like little bits that do specific jobs. Uh, and but like me, I'm happy with that. You know, yeah. If 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 I want uh, virtual analog, I'll 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 go to the V synth. If if I want, you know, a, a baseline, I'll, I'll I'll go to the the sub thirty seven. So, it, it it things tend to work like that. And uh, maybe if you you know you you do want to keep things compact for whatever reason, finances or you know uh, portability in some way mm. I, I i don't know like if it was finances i, I presume this isn't going to be cheap so i can't imagine it will it, no. it, it's an expensive all-in-one solution so i don't know i really love the ribbon thing i think that's that's yes that's a, yeah a great addition to the control options and it, one bit it said it comes with a massive 3.5 gigabytes of user storage and i thought Wow, I, I was like, like genuinely going like, wow. And I thought, hang on, it's three point five gigabyte. But I've got a a sixty four gigabyte SD card in me S six thousand. So yeah, they could have gone a little bit more. It, it, it is overkill that sixty four gigabyte SD cards. Like it's like you're never gonna fill them. But um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I'm a bit underwhelmed with the whole thing. Really, I like the ribbon controller, but yeah what else is there's nothing new really no I, I think you know the workstation still has its place i still think there's a obviously people are still making them there's a market for them there's people who will just use or want to use one keyboard that can pretty much do everything really yeah. well um maybe not you know in, you know great in specific areas but it can you know you've you've got your acoustic samples you've got your organs you'll have your virtual analog you'll have you know whatever you know fm this one contains six operator fm compatible with uh the old um dx sys x but as you say you know it's um it's kind of a um jack of all trades maybe and it's a very expensive one but saying that kurzweil they've got a great build quality or reputation for great build quality so I, I'm, I'm imagining this is no different and you know it's kind of uh, if you want one, this is probably up there with the best of them. What do you think, Chris? I mean, you, I know you're definitely not a workstation guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I've actually never owned a workstation. Uh, I, I kind of heard about Kurzweil in a major way, I guess, uh, through Pink Floyd. I know Andy Dixon was mentioning it uh, in the group the other day, and that's kind of where my familiarity with them came. And uh, I, I do think it fills those kind of purposes really well. Um, I, I'm definitely in the mindset of like, you know, buying something for a very particular sound and that's what it does. I mean, when I got the Moog one, it, it's got three layers to it. I was like, oh, boy, what do I get, what do I get to do with these extra two layers that I have? You know? <laughs> it was not really part of my workflow up until then. So, uh, you, you know, I, I think we're seeing a lot of people or at least as, you know, checking out live performances or, you know, whatever it is on YouTube or if you're actually able to go see live music, uh, music a lot. I see a lot more people with laptops and controllers and then using something like Mainstage uh, to, to switch through complex programs. So um, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see if this takes off. Yeah. I, there's, there's definitely a market. There's a Kurzweil fan base, shall we say. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, those that are committed Kurzweil um, users will probably look at an upgrade path and then maybe you bring you know a few other people it's got an audio interface built in as well which is always useful um, lots of pads um, keys uh, a big keyboard obviously big weighted keyboard and um, yeah lots of control and uh, yeah. you know one thing that would that would probably be an advantage I mean if you have it if it you know it's got a nice key bed and everything is that like playing live the sim simplicity in your rig because things always go wrong mm -hmm. and so having oh, something yeah. that's streamlined and that's less moving parts uh, i mean <coughs> metaphorically moving parts but yeah uh, you know so yeah. you're not worried about laptops and different things going down or you know multiple multiple sense into some sort of switcher um, yeah. you've got everything in one box and you're a little less worried about things like that happening yeah, that's a, sure. That's an excellent point. That um, I remember, I, I went from two like a, a hardware synths, I'll call them. It was a 
virus ti and vsync and i went from them to a main st stage setup because i wanted it to be simpler but i found that i was plugging more stuff in because i had like an audio interface to connect up uh, and you know other bits and bobs keyboards to connect and i ended up where i had more wires than i had before with the two hardware synths and the, the idea that everything would just run from this this laptop and uh, it'd be streamlined mm. and then uh, i came to the the solution of uh, i got um, a keyboard uh, got the nectar nectar panorama keyboard oh yeah and that's powered off USB. So that was like, that only needed then one wire. Mm -hmm. And I did the same with a, a Yamaha MX49. But that was became the audio interface. So I managed to cut it down that way. Yeah. But if you did have an all-in-one, I can see what the, the very long-winded way I'm getting to this. <laughs> is I, I can see that like just dragging out one keyboard out of a bag, sticking it on the stand, two, two leads into it. And you're ready. You're ready to go. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and it, it does. It, Chris is quite right there. It, it has a massive uh, potential with that. Mm. And there, there is a whole uh, industry of uh, solo players or duos that you know that they, they, they populate your clubs and your bars and your cruise liners. And there's just you know maybe a guy and a gal. And uh, you know, one guy, one person's at the keyboard doing everything, and the other person's singing. And there's, you know, there's a huge uh, market for these things. Maybe just not so much in the commercial music making market as, w as we've known it in the past. But yeah, there you yeah. go, Kurtzwell K twenty seven hundred. Apparently, it's going to be around two and a half thousand. I don't know whether that's UK pounds or US dollars, that's but pounds. it's pounds. So that's going to be yeah. about three thousand. Yeah, three thousand US. Competitive, I think. Compared to some of the others, which I think are a little bit more expensive. Same, but. Yeah, same area, isn't it? Yeah, Definitely. it is. Yeah, it's well, ballpark. Cro I mean, Kronos if you think about it cheap. compared 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 to what you get out of uh, mm. you know a sequential OB6 or Prophet Six, yeah, I mean, you're getting a lot more out of, out of the <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Anyway, yeah. that's the Kurzweil K K2700. More on that, I guess, as we get some more specific information on there. Let's move to the other big news of the week, and this is for all of the MPC heads out there. Um, this is the news that Akai have released um, the 2.1 uh, feature update OS for the MPCs, and it has some incredible features. I'm gonna play this whole video because um, there's a lot of stuff in here, and I wanna make sure everyone kind of sees this. Fourteen new plugins, four new instruments, and some of these look really, really cool. Mellotron, Selena's, even an Odyssey. Now that's really cool. You can plug in an audio interface into it. There you go. So the humble Akai MPC. Who would have thought like 20 years ago when the MPC was kind of like going like this in terms of popularity and Machina was coming in and everyone was moving to laptops or, or tablets and stuff. And, the, you know, the, the MPC really lost its mojo, particularly when Akai Japan collapsed and then it was bought out by uh, what is now the In Music Group. And it kind of just lost its way. And now they've come back with this, and to see an MPC be able to do all of that stuff in the box. I mean, we're talking about workstations. What else do you need? 14 plug-in instruments, including Mellotron, Selena's, Arp Odyssey simulations, and more besides vocal effects. It, you can plug a USB audio interface and then ch chuck all of your microphones and your guitars and DIs and everything into this one box. It's just... I'm really impressed. It's actually made me think 
maybe I do need an NPC in my life again because the only one I've got left now is a little NPC 500 which of course does nothing like that um Ben what do you think about this I, I was just blown away by it I, I was I was as well I, I, when I first saw it but like having to think about it in in an objective way because I'm coming on here to talk about it I started to wonder myself really like but for me, I would use something like an NPC to impose limitations on myself to get something else out of myself creative-wise. creative, creative wise. Uh, And I think, that, like, I'm the type of person that would work. You know, if, I, if all of a sudden I can only do one big sound and I can't do 400 at once, you know, I would focus more on that and, and and probably work more efficiently on the on the limited yeah. system but it's bringing so much into it now that it, it, it's not limited with but they're like stuck between the devil and the deep blue the the damned if they do and the damned if they don't because <laughs> you, you you've got to keep up with what's going on around yeah. you but the the old attraction to it in the first place is going away. It's only short of a keyboard, mouse, and monitor now, really, in my opinion. That's you know, you stick them and, on it, and you're back where you started. And if the rumours are to be believed, they are producing a, a keyboard version. Um, our oh, friend yeah, Tom yeah. at Synth Anatomy has kind of uh, uncovered that um, yeah. a, an MPC keyboard is in the yeah. works I, I think you should congratulate them on on doing a superb superb job and like you were saying if they were slightly the underdogs a while back they, they, they've just grabbed it with both hands and they, they've nailed it as far as yeah. I can see but for me personally I think what attracted me to it in the first place isn't it, it isn't really there anymore I'd yeah. have to get one of those Polyon yeah. tracker things or something. I don't know. <laughs> I, I can understand it, and for the users who's who's come along with it, you know, and they they had a limit, a more limited palette to work with, and now they've got all these additional things. It must be absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And you know, kudos to them for for doing what they've done because it, it it does look excellent. But yeah. like I say, it, it's. The reasons that I'd be going to it a fade in a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I was always impressed by people who could do stuff on an NPC. I was just like, how on earth are you getting all of that from that box and a few samples and just chopping and slicing it? Just incredible skills that some of these people had. Um, and like, yeah, I, I get your point that you, you know it's kind of now it just does it does everything. It's basically a door in a box because um, this update is for MPC one. MPC Live 2, MPX, and MPC, and I guess that's the Akai uh, MPC Force will get something uh, fairly similar. Um, Jim, again, are you have you got history with MPCs at all? Does this sort of thing you know appeal to you? Your thoughts? You know, it, it's it's been interesting to watch this kind of stuff the last couple of years, um, especially like on Instagram. It, it, I almost wonder if it's like a generational thing, like the mm. kids what I call kids like Rachel Collier, for example, brilliant, yeah. you know, she and, and, and this whole younger generation seem to love that kind of thing. Mm. But again, you know, kind of like workstation hardware for me, I just never, it's not the way my brain works. Um, mm. I've just always been purely interested in synthesizers and software, you know, logic and, and, uh, you know, whatever doll you, you use, um, give me a copy of reactor any day or, or, you know, that's where I kind of do my experimenting or, or left of center type stuff. Um, so, I, you know, I guess for me, time is at such a premium. I'm always trying to be conscious of how I spend that. And, you know, and so, you know, if I'm going to bring a piece of gear into the studio, it, it's usually going to be a synth of, of some kind. Um, and, you know, as, as far as peripheral gear, I mean, maybe I, I, I totally get why there's the appeal for it. It just doesn't work for my brain the way I like to work, sure. um, but it definitely is impressive. I mean, just the, the video you just showed was the first I've really seen it because I, I just don't really pay attention to that mm. side of things. But clearly, I'm, um, I don't know if I'm in the minority, but there, again, I do think there's maybe a generational aspect to it. You know, these, this younger crop of musicians seems to love. 
you know, being surrounded with all these small bits of gear, you know, whether it's an NPC or like a core chaos pad or, or stuff like that. I get it. I mean, you know, it definitely, I think it appeals to the experimental side of the brain, you know, and, and guys obviously get a lot of usage out of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. For me though, it would slow me down. I'm just so used to working at blazing speed mm -hmm. in the computer, you know, and I've got this giant 60 inch monitor in front of me so I can have everything there. It's streamlined and it's effective and I can work fast. Um, but yeah, so it, it, yeah. Example two of something that doesn't really <laughs> doesn't appeal to me. It's just sure. not, you know, yeah. but I get why it appeals to people. It, it's yeah. definitely a cool, cool thing. So, yeah, absolutely. It's um, the, the, the features are just incredible. They're just you know, scanning through here. They, they're clearly making use of their partnership. Sorry, their ownership. Well, it's not Akai that own it, but the, the, the umbrella brand own uh, Air that produce a lot of these sample based plugins um they now own m audio so this whole you know interactivity with um external audio interfaces they're, they're really kind of bringing together all of that stuff i mean if you look at the brand names under here you know air are in there um akai Alesis, um you know all this stuff is kind of being brought to bear in in these instruments and these machines and it's just yeah i mean it's just unrecognizable uh, again chris i'm i'm assuming that this um is not something that you would normally find in your studio all right and just to build a little on what jim was saying i think <clears throat> i mean i've got a 16 inch macbook and the screen's not big enough for me so <laughs> i i couldn't see myself going uh to device like this and, and something i've mentioned before and i and i would love to hear you know maybe as i talk to more musicians to kind of to test my theory but you know people if we kind of split people into uh as far as learners into audio and kinesthetic you know, wanting to be hands-on or listening, uh, and then to tester and visual. Um, and I'm I'm on the visual side of the spectrum. Yeah. Like uh, a workflow that is uh, is very tactile isn't gonna doesn't I don't need to have that this in the same way. And I'm I'm pretty comfortable to do stuff on a screen and a dot. I don't mind that workflow. In fact, I, I find it a lot easier. So I feel like I know where I'm at better. Whereas I can definitely see where other people need to feel where they're at by having their hands touching things, you know, mm -hmm. buttons and, and knobs and pushing sliders to have that feel. And that's not to say I don't love working on synthesizers that are knobby, I do, but um, I just don't have to have it in the same way that other people do, and nor do they have to have the visual that I have to have. Um, but it, I, I love listening to, to people to use these devices and to see how, how creative and how it fits their workflow. Um, the, one other thing that I wanted to mention is that it uh, would be tomorrow morning for me, I, and it would be uh, tomorrow afternoon for, for most people who watch a show. But uh, Ramsey's show, uh, Ramsey will yeah. have uh, uh, Andrew Brooks in the, the, the chat and Inky, and they'll mm -hmm. be getting really deep into this. So yes, anybody that's uses. really wanting a deep dive with people who uh, use these devices, I think both uh, Andy and uh, uh, Lisa have NPC devices. So they do. Yeah. They'll, they'll be the ones to uh, really uh, have a good take on this. Yeah. It's, it's funny because when I was doing stuff with Akai, which like 20 odd years ago and the mpc was you know a lot of that was mpc the guys that were using mpcs for a living were also using workstations because that's what was providing the string sounds or the piano sounds or you know all that. so they were making their beats and you know maybe doing the bass lines or having a some kind of um percussive element you know or, you know uh, a tuned element on the on the MPC, but most of their their stuff was from motifs. I think that was the kind of the big one at the time. So you know, most like producers in R and B and hip hop had an MPC and a motif. And here we are talking about you know these new workstations and MPCs. It hasn't gone away. There's still a big kind of market for these things. But yeah, I mean, what a great update, and it's free. So if you already have this this equipment, you know, all of that stuff will cost you no extra cash, which it's got to That's be a great brilliant. way of going. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. Um, let's do one little more news topic, and then we're going to crack on and um, talk to, to Jim in a bit more detail about his stuff. Um, let's have a look at 
right uh let's do let's just do this little one here because um i have a uh, as as everybody knows and keeps ribbing me about i have um a, a, maybe an un unhealthy obsession with um bluetooth wireless midi um <laughs> But this was interesting to see because this is not anything to do with um, the company that I uh, normally sort of wax lyrical about, CME. This is to do with uh, Boss, um, who obviously are part of the Roland Corporation, and this is their EV1 wireless MIDI expression pedal. So now you can have this uh, completely independent of anything uh, expression pedal with a Bluetooth MIDI connectivity. But you can also hook this up via TRS MIDI and regular MIDI and USB, so it's universal. So a nice little addition to, to their pedal range there. Uh, again, you know, a lot of people are uh, hesitant about using Bluetooth MIDI in a live environment, so I'm gonna to defer to our, our, our sort of professional live musicians here. Jim, would you ever risk using Bluetooth MIDI on stage in your job, considering how high profile that is? It's funny you ask. Uh, uh, let's see. It was 2019. I actually did. Uh, I right. tried it a few times. Uh, Yamaha came out with a, a, a keytar, which I swore I would never do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but hey, 48 years old, why not try it? <laughs> and, but the, the funny thing, kind of ironic, was that the artist I work with, his name is Michael W. Smith. He, we were doing kind of um, that tour was called the 35 years of hits. He's been doing it for a long time. And in the middle of the show, he wanted to kind of do a broken down acoustic set where we all came forward. And mm -hmm. one of the guys had a little cocktail drum kit and one of the guys had an acoustic bass. Well, I don't have an acoustic keyboard. So I had this little Yamaha guitar and it has Bluetooth MIDI. And, um, I tried it a few times and it actually worked really well, but there were just one or two times where all of a sudden something would get stuck. And so I, I like, I'm not going to risk this anymore. <laughs> yeah. So I just got a 50 foot USB cable with a power thing, but I love the idea. Um, mm. I would certainly do it in the studio, but um, yeah, I, I, I had just enough glitches, but you know, who knows it, in that environment, you've got all kinds of wireless microphones and and yeah. you know all that kind of stuff you're asking for trouble in that environment yeah. i think but absolutely um, in the studio whole different story yeah and uh, a wireless expression pedal would that appeal to you in, even in the studio environment you know just one less cable to have uh i don't think in the studio because i you know again I, I i actually am pretty ocd about having <laughs> everything just the way i want it and so i've got at my main workstation i've got two expression pedals one is sent to one keyboard that sends MIDI expression and the other one sends um, I keep it assignable uh, I have a little okay. app that lets me reassign the controller because when I'm doing uh, orchestral programming a lot of libraries you need as many hands as you can get you know yeah. one to do volume and one to do expression and so I usually have two and they're you know they're permanently wired so um, mm -hmm. you know I don't I guess I could see the use for it. It's just yeah. something on the fly. It would, yeah. it would be pretty cool. Cool. Ben, um, you invested in some wireless MIDI dongles. Um, and yeah. I don't know if you've been brave enough to try them in, in, in a live environment, because that was always the concern when we were talking about this. In yeah. the studio, I mean, I've got a whole bunch of them set up around here, and it makes things really convenient. I don't have to plug in you know, half as many cables as I normally would. Um, but in a live environment, as Jim pointed out, there's so many different radio frequencies bouncing around that, you know, is it going to get uh, affected? Is the connection going to be that good, um, as, as good as they claim it should be? Have you have you been brave enough to try it yet? Not yet, no, because no. there's that much going going wrong as it is. I don't want <laughs> to add to that to list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's just another thing to worry about and have a sleepless night about. So yeah. uh, I'm going to leave it for the time being. But once I'm happy with everything... I will give it a go, and yeah. and this expression pedal as well. I would be interested in that. Uh, like like Jim said, there's not really much use for it in the studio, really. Mm -hmm. It's it's no trouble having a wire coming off, and it'd be tucked away anyway. Nobody's you know, but I suppose you could reassign it quickly to other other purposes, maybe. That, yeah, that might be a possibility. But live, definitely. Uh, 
just being able to get it out of a bag, shove it on the floor, and it works. That it's less pack up, and yeah, yeah I'm I'm well up for that. Yeah, it's a great idea. I mean, personally, I th- I would because say I have this kind of awkward situation where my my controller kind of sits in the middle of the room, and so anything that's connected to that, I've got cables kind of draping down, which is why it's all wireless MIDI. So the only cables are the power cables, but I do have a pedal under here that you know I have to wrap the cable around the the legs of the keyboard stand so that I don't trip over it and pull everything off onto the floor or the cats don't get caught up in it when they come in. So, you know, it's something like that, you know, would, would be, would interest me, uh, you know, in my environment, but that's kind of quite unique. What do you You think, Chris? Oh, sorry, Jim, go on. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, um, you just reminded me, I do have this little Korg. It's called a micro key air. It's just a little three. They make them in, I think three or four different sizes. I actually really like that when I take that on the road with me just to work in hotel rooms. Mm. And that's brilliant because you can pull it out of your bag, open your laptop, and it, it works 100% yeah. of the time. Um, so for programming on the road, that kind of thing, it's actually brilliant for that. Yeah, um, especially you know, if you're on a tour bus and stuff. You know, that yeah. Really, it's yep. just dead yeah. simple, yeah. That cool. to me is where the wireless thing really is nice because you know, time on the road is limited anyway. So mm. if I only have a couple hours in the morning to, to work in my hotel room, it's you know, I used to have this elaborate mobile studio, and it was such a pain. It would take an hour to set up and an hour to tear down. Yeah. And these days, all you need is a little wireless keyboard like that, and yeah, set of earbuds, and you're good. Yeah. No, that's that's a good point, Chris. Yeah. Your thoughts on this as a guitarist, maybe? Yeah. Uh, for studio and live, uh, this is something that I was interested in. The the one thing that I really don't like about it is it takes batteries. Right. Uh, I would, it, in this day and age, having something that that you can plug into your regular USB adapter and charge up would be much preferable to me. Uh, but for the studio, like uh, I, you know, I guess if you have like a pretty um, stable rig, uh, like Ben said, you don't need to move it around a lot. A, a corded one is just fine. I was thinking, you know, to be able to use it for. Uh, different synthesizers, but then also if I'm controlling software uh, in Logic for guitar, then mm-hmm. being able to kind of move around because, you know, I might be turned over here playing synth, or I might be standing playing guitar or sitting playing guitar in a different position while I'm recording, and that would be kind of a nice thing to just quickly move around. Now, if I could just plug it in up on the desk here to charge it, that would have that would have sealed the deal for me. So I have to, mm-hmm. I have to think about this one, but... As far as the 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 wireless and and live goes, I mean this is uh, Bluetooth, and I've not used Bluetooth live. I've I've used uh, guitar wireless packs uh, live for for a, a lot of years. So mm-hmm. um, I don't know as far as the Bluetooth versus versus you know these other radio packs that have been that have been used for years and years. How what the reliability is, but at least for something like this. You're not talking about your main signal. You're talking about uh, a controller that's controlling one aspect. So even if it dumps on you, you know, you still are playing. You still have your sound. It's just locked in a position maybe yeah. until you reset it. Um, for for wireless, though, I, mm. you know, things have gotten a lot better over the years as they've really dialed it in. Uh, uh, I think uh, Synthetic uh, brought up the, the you know the classic Spinal Tap scene where they're having <laughs> radio signals at the uh, Air Force Base and yeah. and that happening. I've I never had that happen. I've I've actually had that happen once on a, a fuzz pedal that was starting to have some problems and it picked mm-hmm. up some radio stuff, <laughs> but never from wireless. And the first wireless unit I had would have been like far beyond what was you know used in Spinal Tap, but then. Uh, this last one that I got, which was I, um, oh crap, who made? Uh, sure, actually makes it. Okay. And as I, I, you know, I don't, I don't like wireless things usually because they always mess with your tone in some way, okay. uh, particularly for guitar. And so that was that was always kind of a concern, but they've gotten really close at for live use. I mean, the latency's so low. It's reliable. I mean, I've I've walked out of buildings that I've I've been playing in or venues, <laughs> just to see how far it could go with the guitar, mm. and you know without interference and before the signal would actually just kind of break out break off. Yeah. So, uh, my experience has been pretty good with wireless stuff. Um, I I would like to see how you know some them do some work on this, like again to make it rechargeable, 
and uh, to see, you know, maybe some other competitors would come out with stuff like this. And I think it could be very popular because you imagine, you know, setting up pedals on big stages and you've always seen, you know, the cables going out to you one wah pedal or something, you know, yeah. these guitars that have one thing that are way, way, is way out there. But to have something like this controlling something back by your amp or for your keyboard or whatever would be, would be very nice. Yeah. 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 It's, um, it's funny because, you know, having the interest in, in the, the witty masters that, uh, CME make, there are a lot of people in the, um, the testing part of that who are testing it on guitar pedals because obviously there are a lot of guitar pedals that have regular five pin uh, MIDI ports on them yeah. and mm -hmm. they're using those. And I, uh, maybe that's more versatile um, to do it that way because then you can be very specific about what you connect and what you connect it to. Whereas this, you know, it just seems to be one, one size for, for everything, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting to see that, um, wireless midi that you know it kind of came and went away because it wasn't that great but certainly with with bluetooth 5 and um you know subsequent iterations of the protocol it seems to have gotten so much better low power consumption great connectivity pretty reliable connectivity from from by all accounts um yeah interesting to see boss ev1 wl is uh is, is out now i believe i don't know don't have a price it, on it but it is uh, interesting but like if you look at the back there it looks like it's got a bluetooth button yeah, that's a pairing button. It could yeah. be potentially disastrous. That like, I think. I'd, <laughs> well, I'd rather, I, I guess that yeah. Be under a flap or something. That I wouldn't want that being. You have got that cable right near. If that, I don't, I don't know. But like, yeah. like you say, it's only stuck in one, one position, isn't it, for a short while until you sort well, it out. Well, I, I guess that button is just to set it into pairing mode, and hopefully yeah. they've made it a long press thing, so you can't just <laughs> yeah. knock it. Because yeah. that was actually one of the early things that we had with um, the the CME stuff was that there's this button now it's it's flush it sits flush with the actual plug so you you actually have to go and push it you can't just knock it and people were pushing it and putting the unit into uh, not pairing mode but into an update mode and you can't get it out of that until you actually run the update and they didn't have the appropriate firmware or the app to to update it so they were kind of effectively uh, killing the unit but um yeah it, 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 i'm sure I, I would hope that they'd made that kind of a long press thing anyway um and, that's hey, sorry okay. just yep. one one quick thing because over the last couple of weeks like we've had more requests to discuss the boss guitar than pretty much any other piece <laughs> of gear and I, and it's a guitar and, and i don't want to discuss it for a long time but just real quickly i mean the the I, I think this was developed with that in mind, and so right. it's it, you know they're coming out together and obviously to be designed. But as far as guitar controllers for synthesizers, um, you know it doesn't look like that guitar is going to be the thing that you want. It would probably be better to go with uh, Jamstick Studio or something that's a still a real guitar but has, or or the uh, Fishman Triple Play would also be something that you can retrofit onto your guitar yeah. if you need to trigger synthesizers that way I, I think this this boss guitar is more a guitar with some synth stuff thrown into it it's just yeah. not really looking that great to me yeah they're, they're plugging that eurus gs1 here is you know in there and there's various other things because roland have come out with their own um widi or sorry wireless midi dongles as well so um, yeah it's an interesting uh, development and uh, yeah we'll keep a close eye on that one right um let us get into talking to our very special guest jim danica um let me just bring up your your website so we can uh, do that at the same time and i should have done that ahead here but there we go i'm useless at this right jim danica composer producer and arranger um Tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what you do, basically, because you're, you're not just um, a, a musician with a studio. You are a musical director and a performer um, with a very large name artist over there in the United States. But you also develop software and sample libraries and you do um, you've got a side project for music for, for sync and that kind of stuff. So. Tell us a little bit about yourself, where you started and how you kind of came to be where you are today. Well, um, yeah, gosh, where do you start? Uh, <laughs> so I grew up in the 70s and 80s. Um, I think my first real musical influence was John Williams. I mean, as soon as I saw Star Wars as a sure. kid, um, 
so I, you know, funny thing for me is I grew up in a home where I was really the only musical person. Um, I guess it skipped a generation. I found out my dad's dad and my grandfather, who I never knew was an opera singer. <laughs> so other than that, I was the only one. So I kind of, and my dad was a pastor. So, so we didn't, the kind of music I grew up with in the house was like, I don't even know how to describe it. So I kind of had to find my own way. And mm. um, so for me, you know, it was a he heavy diet of John Williams. You know, anytime there'd be a, a Steven Spielberg movie, you know, I would absorb that. But 80s pop radio. I mean, that, that's the stuff I grew up on. Phil Collins, sure. Genesis, Peter Gabriel, you know, all things 80s. So mm -hmm. that's that's my first love. Um and then uh, along with that, there was this guy who I ended up working with, Michael W. Smith, who in the Christian pop realm, he was um, purely on a musical level. I just loved the stuff that he was doing because he very heavy into synthesizers and uh, he actually did some really creative stuff. And um, he's a brilliant pop songwriter. And so there was kind of that little niche that I followed for, for those years. And I just kind of decided early on probably in my early teens that I wanted to eventually move to Nashville and ideally work with him or people like him. And that ended up happening. It was very unusual. You know, most people have to pay their dues for quite a while. And I, I did for a little while. I drove a truck <laughs> for, for three <laughs> months when I moved to Nashville. I worked at a music store on the weekends. And um, there was a band called DC Talk at the time, which was really big in, in that market. And they hired me to drive a truck around the country that summer and set up band gear. And and uh, so I did that for about three three months. And then I did front of house. I mixed audio for a, a comedian for a couple months. And at that point, I had moved 800 miles away from my family. They're all still in Pennsylvania. And I moved to Tennessee. So I didn't know anybody. And it got to be you know, a case of what am I doing with my life? You know, I don't, uh, what am I doing here? And one Saturday I was home from the road and I got a phone call from the guy who was Michael's musical director at the time. And Pro Tools had just come out. Nobody knew mm -hmm. what it was. And I was just this 22 year old kid who was obsessed with synthesizers and technology. And luckily for me, there was a company called Hydratech in the, in the, I guess all through the eighties and nineties that they were based in LA and they did all the big tours. Um, you know, Michael Jackson and Madonna and you name it. And one of their clients was Michael and, uh, and Amy Grant, who's another, she's a top name in the, in the, especially in the Christian pop world. And so anyway, this company had just gone out of business and they needed somebody to come in who could kind of build this elaborate keyboard MIDI, you know, Pro Tools playback rig that would run the whole show. So that's what I was hired to do um, for that first year. And, um, but because Michael was still in his kind of pop heyday, he was still getting played on pop radio a lot. And he wasn't able to come to soundcheck a lot. And since I grew up on his music, I was able to kind of fill in for him. So it kind of became the running joke that I was stunt doubling for, for him. <laughs> and um, a year later, I, I just approached him and I said, look, I can, I really wanted to play. I didn't want to just be a tech, you know, because it's kind of like in the acting world. Once you start doing a, a certain role, that's what you get branded as. Mm. And as a as a keyboard tech, I didn't want to be known as that. I wanted to be playing and, and doing the creative side. So I called him one day and I just said, hey, I can I can still run the show. I can build the rig in a way where I can run it from stage, but I can play as well. And he knew I could play by that point. So. I think I appealed to the accountants, you know, I, that it's one less bunk on a bus. It's one less yeah. hotel room. I can do two jobs for the price of one. And, and so all joking aside, he, we, we've become good friends over the years and uh, it's been an adventure. So that's, that's the main thing. That's um, yeah. on a normal year, very unlike the last one, <laughs> yeah. we do maybe 90 tour dates a year spread out uh, some years, a little bit more, some less. So the rest of the year, which is, you know what 270 days whatever um i just work at home here doing um all kinds of projects producing album projects for people um arranging doing some film music and then about two years ago um the backstage pass stuff started and that mm. came out of 
um, for years, people would ask me if I would consider selling the custom sounds that I made for, right. for, for my, my own rig. And I always said, there's no, I don't have the time for one thing. And I also thought there was no platform. How am I going to, you know, I don't want to get into, you know, contact and developing sample libraries. It just wasn't that interesting to me. And I just didn't know how I would do it. And then, um, I started seeing that a lot of major acts were using main stage, uh, Toto in particular, mm -hmm. and uh, David Rosenthal with Billy Joel. He has a big elaborate main stage rig. And I thought, you know, maybe this is, maybe the time is coming to I can pursue this. And we actually had a big empty summer two years ago. And so it was more a function of keeping food on the table, <laughs> you know, figuring out how, you know, I've never been on salary and, and I thought, I'll, I'll give this a shot. And so I put together this, um, this main stage environment that is really, at the time, it was geared for live players. And uh, it lets you, it, it, you, I just saw you showed the iPad controller. That mm. was a, a crucial component of it because it, it's really my personal rig that I use. And I just kind of build it in a way that would appeal to anybody who's doing main stage stuff live. But I use an iPad for and everything. That's, and that's Touch OSC, isn't it? Yes, it's Touch yeah. OSC. And um, so it's very much a hands-on way of bridging the gap between software and hardware. I, mm. I wanted to give people the, a, a system where, first of all, the sounds had to be top-notch. But just as important, I want them to be uh, customizable and con you know to, to be able to control it the way you want. So I just kind of built something that that's based on what i use and um so that was the first version of it and then i started putting out little expansion libraries then the the next one was um a, a dedicated piano sample from a, a guy here in town named blair masters and blair plays for garth brooks he's out doing stadiums right now okay and he has done a marvelous job of capturing his yamaha c7 and um so we did that but my real pride and joy is uh DX Dreams, which came out back in March, and it's all based on the 80s. It's all a bunch of really iconic DX sounds that was, you know, that were all over the radio from, you know, 1983 to 1988, 89. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's kind of where it's all going. I'm, I'm wanting to do a series like that, where that one was obviously based on the DX family. And then I've got one that I'm working on based on the Prophet 5. Another one based on all the Roland analog stuff, you know, the Jupiter 8, uh, Juno 106. You know, so it's it's a way to give people those iconic sounds that are radio ready, you know, because um, a DX7, as you know, by itself sounds not all that interesting. It's mono. Yeah. It's, it, you know, keyboards didn't have built-in effects in those days. But when you go back and you listen to pretty much anything from that time, you know, Simple Minds or, or Tears for Fears, all those great sounds, I the way I approach it is I process those sounds and I sample them through all that hardware of the 80s, like the, um, you know, Roland Dimension D chorus and analog tape and Neve 1073 preamps. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, one of the secret sauce elements was the AMS reverb, the RMX 16. Yeah. Um, that's a big part of all those sounds. So I sampled impulse responses from that. So it kind of gives people, you know, I guess, especially in cover bands, a lot of guys want those iconic sounds, but they don't know how to get them, you yeah. know, with, with just a raw DX7. So it's it's really a passion project. It's something that I did first and foremost because I just love those sounds. It's it's such a big part of my story, you know, and, and yeah. I think a lot of other people who, who grew up in that time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's a fascinating thing. I mean, I've... Um i've got main stage i've got logic i don't use it live ben's the the main stage guy um have you got any questions you'd like to to throw jim's way in that regard uh, yeah i mean it it looks awesome what you what you've done and uh i was, I was watching some of the videos earlier and the, the way it's all presented and the sound quality like you say that that's that's the the most crucial element of it all and it seems as though you've you've done a superb job there as well it's just a, a great package. I, w I was wondering, like, um, you said that this is like full, the, the DX Dreams, for instance, is full of sounds for the 80s cover 
band person. That's me. That's that's what I do. <laughs> so I was wondering if you consider producing one pre DX seven. <laughs> for all the uh, early Depeche Mode and Human League stuff I could do with some help on that uh, but yeah it, it's amazing so how how would um, somebody use that in their setup is it uh, you would just have the extreme set up the, uh, and go through the presets of that or is the, the backstage pass thing is the, the extremes part of of that and you can switch between different configurations if if you've got me yeah so it's there's a couple days a couple ways to approach it i i kind of think of it as a modular family so backstage pass is just what i call the overall umbrella for everything right. for all the libraries backstage pass itself was the initial release and that one is really just kind of a general toolkit it's it's two custom sampled pianos. All, all the samples in it are all custom. Um, and so um, two, two acoustic piano, actually, sorry, no, one is a digital piano. It's from a Yamaha, uh, the, the P series back in the early 90s or mid 90s. Um, Michael, the guy I work for, he, that was such a crucial part of his sound. A lot of the guys that follow me really love that. It's a, it's a really bright cutting piano in a live setting. It is superb. Yeah. It's got a real big bottom end, real crystal uh, clear top end, and it cuts through any mix. So I sampled that, um, but the other is an acoustic piano. Uh, it's, a, it's a smaller version of Blair Masters acoustic piano, but the rest of it is all synth stuff. Uh, there's probably 40 or 50 different synth pads and textures from all wow. kinds of different synths from the yeah. 80s and 90s. Um, there's a Hammond B3 uh, organ channel strip in there that's based on Michael's B3 and Leslie that I played for years, which actually he bought from Peter Frampton. It's the wow. It's the B3 that you, that you hear on Peter Frampton stuff. Nice. Um, so it's a close match to that. There's uh, and that one's not sample based. That one uses the Logic um, B3 model and Leslie. But I added a uh, there's a reverb, a real short uh, room reverb that to me totally brings that to life because a Leslie. It needs the room that it's in. That's part of the sound, you know. So there's that. There's a there's a custom um, a, a live string patch in there that's based on string sessions I've done over the years. Um, someday I need to do a video just on that because so many guys when they try to play strings live on a keyboard, it always sounds awful because they're they're approaching it like like a keyboard player mm. instead of. A string arranger you know and and not asking the samples to do more than they can do that's that's a big part of that but that's another topic um so anyway backstage pass is the the bread and butter sounds from then on like dx streams for example that's a it's it's a standalone uh main stage environment but i'm putting all these sounds out so that they can complement each other and you can load anything from one into the other right. or if you've got say there's there's other companies putting out main stage libraries like there's one called sunday sounds for the like the the modern worship guys that, that buy a lot of the stuff that i do uh so some of those guys might prefer that setup so i've set it all up and built the documentation to show you how to import things from one main stage environment into another yeah. so there's five or six ways you can access this stuff i'm also starting to include logic sessions that have everything laid out for you so that if you're a logic user, you can access sounds by the channel strip library or right in the sampler plugin itself. Yeah. So there's each one has its own interface. The DX streams one obviously looks like the old TX816 rack. There's eight slots yeah. and some patches use all eight. Some just use two, some use four. Um, other ones are going to be different. The one for the Roland stuff, it's going to have more of a Roland um, looking interface that'll have knobs on it that correspond to the, to the right parameters. Same with the Prophet 5. Um, I'm trying to create, you know, the, the actual GUI in a way that, that looks like the hardware and encourages you to interact with it the way you would with the hardware. So on the Prophet one, for example, it'll have Prophet looking knobs, you know, where possible um, and buttons. So it, it honors that, you know, that legacy. But um, they're all designed to work with each other or by themselves, any combination. 
but the the last thing is that everybody's after me well how comes you're just doing this for logic and main stage what about pro tools what about cubase and the answer to that is i've i've always wanted to put out a generic third party version and it's going to be contact because that just makes the most sense and i'm working on that um but that's a mammoth undertaking because initially i thought it would never happen because it you always lose something when you translate from one format to another and i don't want to compromise the sound quality mm -hmm. first and foremost but i've really done a lot of experimenting and i think it's it's never going to be completely one-to-one -one, but it's it's gotten good enough to where i feel confident that i can finally do that so it's that's coming too, so that other people can take advantage right. of it. Okay. Cool. Hey, uh, so uh, sometime down the show, I'd, I'd really like to talk about live playing, but um, since we're talking about uh, backstage and uh, DX streams, uh, so checking out your channel through the week and, and watching some of your videos, and then this morning I, I just sat and I watched through the entire like hour and a half of your deep dive into DX uh, dreams, and I just want to compliment you on the sound of it. I'm very picky about stuff like that, and you've done a fantastic <laughs> job at it. It sounds really good. I mean, so many, so many um, software instruments. I'll go through the presets. Are like, oh, there's a good one. Uh, no, 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 no. Oh, that one's okay. <laughs> but you know, you going through those patches, like, oh, there's so many classic tones, and and you know, on the video, you you talked about somewhere you 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 get you nailed it. You went to uh, capture it exactly the same patches as were used on the records. Others, you said, I've taken the the spirit of this and kind of made it a little bit better, like an idealized version. Mm -hmm. And I, I like some of those as well. But um, for for somebody that's uh, like, so I, ha I have, I'm a Logic user and I have main stage, but I don't use it because usually when I play live, I get asked to play guitar. Mm -hmm. um, for Logic, uh, if you would, how how would these uh, plugins integrate with Logic a little more for somebody who's using it to record and would, you know, for somebody that's not the cover band player, mm -hmm. but wants to use these classic tones in recordings, how does that work within Logic or another DAW environment? Well, so um, I've started to put, since, since I'm starting to include Logic sessions, you know, in these things, um, there's a part of the documentation that walks you through that. And I'm, I think I did one of the videos. In fact, it might, I don't know if it's the deep dive. There's, there's a few. I actually, yeah. I think I talked about the Logic thing. If yeah, not, at I'm, the I'm, end, you, you get into a little bit at the end. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, this is the problem of having essentially 10 jobs. It's, I can't remember what I've done and what I, what's still on the to-do list. Um, but so to answer your question, though, when you open the Logic session that comes, it's, it's basically set up to mirror the main stage version. It just doesn't have the GUI. The GUI, unfortunately, is always going to be exclusive to main stage because that's what it's built for. Yeah. Um, what I mean by that is main stage is built to allow you to create these really cool graphic environments. I'm not ever going to be a guy who's going to hardcore develop my own plugins or anything like that. I don't have the time. Um, so I'm just creating, first and foremost, I'm creating the sounds. And then for the live guys, you know, I'm, I, it's fun to create the GUI in main stage. I wish there was a way to do it for, for everything else. But for Logic, it's just a matter of accessing it through Logic's uh, patch browser, just like you would anything else, whether it's the factory sounds or third party stuff, it's all shared between main stage and logic. So it, I know I talk about it in the PDF manual and I, if I haven't talked about it in one of the videos, I will, it's, it's coming, but, um, it's all, everything is there. It's exactly the same. The, the logic, um, session that comes with DX streams now, um, like I said, it has whatever it is. I think it's 109 or something like that patches i i specifically set it up to be exactly the same so that like if you're looking at main stage there's a patch list on the left side of the screen yeah. it's the same in logic it's just all 109 patches uh and some of them are, are stacks you know in logic the one thing it does differently is you know there's the track stack thing in logic mm. where you can be playing one track and it's actually accessing three or four different you know instruments or channel strips so i had to recreate all of that which is kind of a pain but um it it's there so it's it's all you know for guys that are in the studio and and when the contact version comes out then of course it'll be the same in any other doll whether it's pro tools or cubase or whatever 
Um, but the idea is that the sounds themselves, they're all exactly the same in logic or main stage. And when they come to contact eventually. So dig extremes, obviously I have a slight interest in this because I'm a huge, as everyone knows, huge uh, DX fan, FM mm -hmm. fan. And you say that, you know, you were inspired uh, a lot by, you know, the music of the eighties as, as I was and the sounds that you, you, you were hearing in the hit records of the day that, that moved you or maybe soundtracked, you know, significant moments in your life. But obviously there were, there were other instruments uh, throughout that era, but what mm -hmm. specifically made you think, you know, the first big library I'm going to make for, for my, my product is going to be DX based. You know, what was the, the motivation behind that? Uh, I actually haven't given that a whole lot of thought, but probably just that it was my first love. I mean, right. you know, it was the time in my life where when the DX seven came out and changed everything, I was 10 years old and I remember going to the, the mall with my with my parents on a Saturday and the second we'd walk in the door, I'd make a beeline for the, the store. And it was one of those old stores where it was all home pianos and organs. Mm -hmm. But in the back, there was this <laughs> inner sanctum, you know, and it was dark and mysterious. But you walked in that door and everything changed. It was like, you know, old ultimate support A-frame stands with nothing but DX product. Yeah, you know, and so the, it almost was like a mythology for me. You know, sure. it just there's just something about it. it. I just have always loved those sounds. But you know, again, it, there was something very different about when I finally got my own DX7 in I think it was the late '80s. I thought this is horrible. This doesn't sound anything <laughs> like what I'm yeah. what I'm hearing on the radio. But that's because I didn't have access to thousands of dollars worth of you know AMS reverbs and a yeah. Roland Dimension D all I had was the keyboard itself. And in those days, it really needed all of that periphery to to sound the way we remember it sounding. Yeah. So um, the other answer to that question is that I just have more of that kind of stuff ready to go. I had gotcha. sampled a bunch of it already and used a lot of those sounds. The rest of the stuff, like the Roland side of things, which is pretty, pretty much just as important, I think, to that era, um, there's just, I just got a good recall of being able to say, okay, well, that electric piano, of course, everybody knows that electric piano sound. Mm -hmm. um, it was used in, on a million songs. Uh, the Top Gun, you know, synth bass, you know, I mean, all that stuff. Um, it just is a part of my vocabulary, I think. Yeah. And um, so it was easy. It was just easy to, and, and it was just the natural progression for me to, that's going to be first. And it's yeah. kind of like a, it's a love letter to my childhood, you know, hmm. and, and to a, just a great era of music. And, and so, like I said earlier, it's just a passion project. Sure. So, so this kind of coincidence with the kind of the reemergence of, of FM synthesizers and FM sounds and that kind of reappraisal of, I mean, I know that, you know, the, the classic FM piano sound and, you know, all of the bell type sounds are, are kind of cliched and a lot of people, um, you know, uh, wail on those kind of sounds as as awful memories but i p personally i think they're great was it just a coincidence that the timing of this coming out was at the same time as you know this fm resurgence i, I think so um it, you know it's funny i we should know by now that things always come back around yeah uh, whether it's bell bottoms or or <laughs> certain, <laughs> certain synthesizers I guess I was always kind of surprised, though, that FM really started coming back. But, but then, you know, Native Instruments did FM7 in what? That was yeah. the late 90s, I think. Yeah. yeah. So it's not like it really went away for long. Um, mm -hmm. And so when it started coming back in earnest, I, I was a kid in a candy store. I thought, great, yeah. now, now I can have some fun with this. But, you know, one of the things that, that I love about FM is it doesn't have to just be those clangy bells or, or that synth bass that we've all heard a million times it's a really creative platform yeah especially with some of the newer fm engines that are coming out um so that's going to be at some point i want to do an expansion on the expansion you know okay uh, and mm -hmm. and do maybe a pack of sounds that are not your typical fm sounds um at, robbie it might have been you the other day somebody either you or somebody posted about their uh they had this little Yamaha keyboard. I've got mine sitting over here. It's oh, that was Mark. Yeah, the yeah, PSR. Yes. 
same story for me. And when I posted about that the same day, um, inspired by him, I had a three or four other guys say, I had that same keyboard. Yeah. And that little thing is, is our little powerhouse. I yeah. actually want to do a, a, a sample pack just on that. And oh, I, yeah. I think that thing is only two operators. It's that's right. You know, you would never know cause it's all under the hood, but it had a really ingenious little, um, programming interface. It had these five or six sliders mm -hmm. that, you know, had the DX7 had that, it might have been even bigger, you know? Yeah. It, it lets you craft these sounds in real time, almost like you would with an analog synth. Mm. But uh, yeah, I, I think FM is, you know, it also gets a bad rap for, for sounding thin and digital, which it can. <laughs> yeah. But when you have a TX816 rack, all <laughs> eight firing at once, playing like a big synth brass, yeah, it's a glorious sound. It has, it's got a huge bottom end because it's all sine waves. Yeah. And when you randomly detune each one a little bit and pan them all apart, it's a massive sound. And that's, yeah. I, I sampled a handful of that kind of thing for DX streams just to kind of show people that, you know, it's really capable of, of much more than people give it credit for. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I, it's, it's fun. I, I just yeah. love that stuff. Yeah. It's funny because um, I think most people of our age, you know, sort of, I don't want to, you know, Careful. age. Yeah, yeah. So I don't want to <laughs> age people. But yeah, those of us who are certain vintage that were, you know, were growing up in the 70s, shall we say. Uh -huh. um, I think a lot of our first keyboards, our first access to this technology, because of our age and because of the affordability, were those small Yamaha or even Casio mm -hmm. uh, keyboards that had very basic synthesizer features, but you know, like you say, the um, that that PS was it the four sixty or the four seventy? Yeah, yeah, one of those. Yep. it had those little direct access um, programming. They just uh, you know changed four or five elements of of the the, yep. the the sound, but it really it's amazing. I I was amazed. Um, my first Yamaha keyboard, actually, my first kind of proper standalone synthesizer was a VSS two hundred, which had the two operator FM, but the little sampling uh, function uh -huh. in there, like you know, half a second of uh, eleven kilohertz or something crazy. Yeah. But you know that was my first kind of uh, proper standalone thing. You know when I was young. So I think we can all lay claim to having at least one of those in our collection at some point. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> yeah. Did you know Guys, six count. <laughs> yeah. it's too posh, it's too posh that. I, I, yeah. I was just i was just wondering jim if um it, say if i bought dx dreams tomorrow would would i just be able to load that even though i haven't got any other backstage past products i'd be able to load that into my setup which i i'm pretty sure that you can uh and yeah. what what would i be getting um like how many like patches would i get in that and so yes, they like I was saying earlier, the, everything they're all the backstage pass libraries are modular. They're they're designed to be used completely by themselves, so they're self-contained, but they also integrate with each other. There's there will be a folder of patches that if you happen to have backstage pass as well, there'll be some combination patches that use pads from one and so on. But yes, back or excuse me, DX Streams itself, um, it's all it's everything's listed on the website, but it it it'll, I think it's a hundred and nine raw source sounds that I sampled and then there's different combinations of those. Right. So at the bottom level there it's 109 different sounds. Um I can't remember the the actual number of patches in the in the main stage concert, but of course that that can change. You can create yeah. your own and, mm -hmm. and it's super easy in main stage to to really get creative and, and just shift click on multiple patches and all of a sudden you've got a new layer. Um, but yeah it comes with the the GUI, the whole interface that you see, which is modeled in the, on the TX-816. It comes with the custom reverb impulses that for the AMS, uh, RMS-16. Um, it's a self-contained environment, it, which is first and foremost for main stage, but it also yeah. comes with the logic session as well. And when you install it, it puts everything in, in place so that you can access the, the raw sounds from either main stage or logic. And I'm hoping that uh, once I get the next six, uh, library out, ideally by the end of this month, um, then I'm going to shift gears and start focusing on on the contact translations. I'm hoping that by end of summer or early fall, I should have all the contact versions done. Most of them will be pretty easy. But the, the one thing about contact that kept me from using it for a long time for this was that some of these sounds use uh, the logic sampler filter model. 
and the envelopes and LFOs to really nail the, the behavior of a DX7. And, and that's a big part of those sounds. Like when you, when you move the mod wheel and get vibrato on a DX7, it's got a really particular sound. And, mm -hmm. and the, I just got lucky the, the logic sampler is capable of perfectly emulating all that stuff. But, you know, context filters and envelopes and LFOs are all different. And so yeah. it's going to be a matter of trial and error. You know, some of the sounds that rely on that stuff, I'm going to have to experiment with and really get it as close as I can. So that's going to be a big project, but it is, it's definitely coming. Yeah. Um, but yeah, hope that answers the, the question. It's, yeah, yeah. yeah, superb. I really like the uh, Touch OSC uh, mm. aspect of it mm. all as well. I think that's a, an excellent addition. Uh, how, how difficult it was that to integrate because we've all got that and we can't use it at the minute. <laughs> it, uh, I tell you what, Touch OSC, I, I was just emailing the developer yesterday. I've used that for over 10 years and I started, uh, in fact, that was the sole reason I got an iPad in whenever yeah. that came out, 2010, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, was for doing uh, programming with sample libraries, you know, they all use different key switch layouts, you know, to, you know, one might be C sharp four to call up spiccato strings. Another one might be C sharp five to call up legato, but they were different for every uh -huh. library. So I got it back then so that I could create a universal articulation switcher basically. So that when I hit staccato, on the iPad, it, it'll change staccato no matter what library I was accessing. Super. So, and it's just grown. I, it's Touch OSC is one of the best things out there. I think it can really streamline your workflow, and so, um, and it, you know, in all kinds of apps as well, whether it's Photoshop or Final Cut Pro, or yeah. it, you can have it do all kinds of things. But uh, so when I decided to do the backstage pass stuff, it was a no brainer. I thought that it, this needs to have a hands-on way of controlling everything you see on screen. Because in a lot, like I use a laptop when I'm doing a live show, but I don't like having a laptop right in front of me. I always have it off to the side. Yeah. So I've got the iPad sitting there so I can discreetly do all my stuff right with the iPad. And um, it's really, you know, it can be time consuming to set it up initially, but uh, in, in this case, it's all done for you. But yeah. um, it's, it's a brilliant, bit of software and it they just did a massive overhaul of it that has yeah. re really really fixed a lot of things and improved a lot of things yeah yeah we we all bought that because yeah and then we just kind of sat there looking at it how do we use this uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's a slow I, I process still but... i still haven't gotten it yet but i got the ipad now so i was waiting yeah. for these guys to tell me how to use it but uh, <laughs> uh we haven't got a clue <laughs> no, no. You know, I, yeah the first version you know that's been around for 10 years it, the editor app you can figure it out in five minutes it's super easy it's mm. just what you see is what you get you you can drag a control onto screen and then you there's an inspector window that you can put in what controller you want it to send and on what channel couldn't be simpler now the new editor is a lot more complicated it it took me the better part of an evening the other day to figure out you know it's it's all different, but it's um, it's worth it's worth pursuing because it, it can really become your best friend. I, I've got two iPads. One is still a the very first ten year old iPad, and it still works with Touch OSC perfectly. So you can find an iPad for twenty five bucks on eBay, yeah. yeah, and it makes a killer touch controller for for all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I I have uh, the vintage the, the the first type of iPad. Um, but I inherited uh, an old, uh, a slightly newer one, but it's way out of date now. But it works with Touch OSC brilliantly. It, yeah, and they sound just, better. The old ones are vintage. They sound better. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's a warmer sound, isn't it? Yeah. Valve, valve in it, in there, yeah. Yeah, yeah <laughs> quite. Um, yeah. Let's just talk about a little bit about your um, your your stage performance stuff and your studio work. I'm just going to bring up this because uh, we, we do like to drool over um studio gear so th this is uh, jim's studio as, as seen on uh, his website which is a, a a lovely collection of um vintage and modern gear all kind of blazing away there so it looks like a really really nice uh, workspace that's where you're sat right now yeah yep that's where i'm at right now and look at that it's stack always there. changing though but that you're right now you're on my favorite picture that that's my wall of 80s the yeah uh, the, oh, the x5 that, yeah. and yeah I see you've had the um, the reverse OLED screen fitted in there as well. Yes, yeah. 
sad story. I actually sold the DX5 a couple months no. ago. I had it for, you know, some of the vintage pieces. Uh, it's it's a funny story. Um, I'll I'll sit and wait. I'll check on eBay every you know couple of weeks just to see what pops up. Mm -hmm. And this all started with the DX7. I, you know, six years ago, <laughs> I had one keyboard in my whole studio. I, I got rid of all of it. And then one day I saw a DX7 pop up for $200 in Japan. And it was flawless. It looked like it was never touched. Mm -hmm. And so I, I bought it. It showed up. And the sides were broken because they didn't pack it well. And uh, so I had a friend make me wood sides for it, which apparently there's half the people out there think that's you know, a faux pas. You don't put wood sides yeah. on a DX7, but I like it. And uh, <laughs> so next thing you know, I, I was I was on eBay all the time and, and I, I would just find a great deal. And the DX5, which Robbie, as you know, I mean, that's that's one notch down from the Holy Grail. There's, there's a yep. DX1, the DX5, and uh, always wanted a DX5. I just think it's such a sexy keyboard. And mm -hmm. um, so I found one about a year and a half ago in Texas and it was it was a good bit it was priced six or seven hundred dollars less than the other two that were out there at the time and um so i got it and it needed a little bit of work i had a friend of mine here who's kind of an expert uh, at that stuff he he had it for six months but he completely renovated it put new da converters in it new output board new power supply he took every key out and gave him a bath i mean it it was stunning when it came back mm -hmm. And uh, but the one of my issues with it was that all the original display, it uses an uh, an EL panel yep. which it whines. It's got a an acoustic noise to it which mm -hmm. I couldn't stand. It sounded like a dog whistle. And uh, so he found an OLED display that looked beautiful. And uh, mm -hmm. but I kept it long enough to do all the marketing videos for DX Dreams <laughs> and to sample it. I sampled it extremely in detail and mm -hmm. and. Um, and then I thought, you know, I can't, I just don't use it enough to justify, it needs to go to a good home. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but yeah, that was, that's quite a piece. Yeah. Because it's, it's this um, misconception that, you know, it's just two DX5s in the box. Yeah. It, it, it's not. It, no, there's, there's, it's not. There's more to it than that, but we shan't go in, because I always get told off for going on and on about these <laughs> things, but you know, whatever. Well, yeah. um, that becomes an advertisement for DX streams, right? Like, I didn't well, need yeah. it anymore. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's, honestly, but, it's, it's funny because the, um, you know, I still have the DX7, of course, and I have the TX816 rack, which at that I will never sell because mm. nothing, it, it, there's just something magic about that. But the only time I ever use the hardware anymore is when I'm developing sounds for the software because once you capture the sound properly through all of those iconic hardware pieces, it it's more satisfying to play mm. the, the software. Um, and there's, I know there's guys out there who are gritting their teeth right now. <laughs> no way. But, um, I, you know, one of you guys were, were very kind a few minutes ago to paying compliment to the, the sound quality. And I, I will say that uh, I've definitely gone probably over the deep end with obsessing about that. Like, it, my standards are so high that um, I won't put it out unless it actually, you know, I want to be able to shut my eyes and you not be able to tell which is the hardware and which is the software. And mm -hmm. it, that's why it takes so long to do these. I, I think I was, I was sampling for six months for, for DX Dreams, you know, right. just because, you know, it was a lot of trial and error. How many velocity layers do I need to capture this sound? Mm. And for some of the patches, it's a lot, you know, it yeah. might be seven, eight to 13 velocity layers because, you know, it's, that well, matters. Yeah, it's because the, the FM timbre changes yeah. with velocity so yeah. much, and that's right. one of the one of the great right. things about it. Yeah. Um, tell us about your your live rig, because obviously you know you, you're touring, like you said, you know, on a, on a non pandemic year, mm -hmm. uh, maybe ninety plus uh, venues around. I guess that's just the the continental United States. Do you travel abroad? Oh yeah, uh, much? well it depends on the year, but um, I think twenty twelve was the year we did the most. We played everywhere from Sri Lanka to Australia. Wow. Uh, South Africa, New Zealand, I mean, all mm -hmm. over the map. So in cases like that, when there's a lot of international travel, usually I will just, tr I have a pedal board. My rig for the last couple of years is actually based on a pedal board like a guitar player would use. And my whole world is on there. My audio interface is, is underneath it. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a sustain pedal and a volume pedal 
mounted to the board and then a multi-pin output cable and um, a USB hub. So the idea is I could show up anywhere in the world with this pedal board and use any controller and okay. I've got my laptop. So my sounds are always the same. It's, it's a laptop, an iPad, and then some kind of controller. And when we're in the States doing a regular tour, then of course it could be more elaborate. I might have, you know, anywhere from two to four physical keyboards. Okay. Um, but I can do it with just any controller you give me. And, um, you know, it's not ideal. It's not fun to, to do that sometimes because you might get something that's, you know, really not great. <laughs> but <laughs> sometimes that's just what you get. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it just depends on what kind of tour it is. But normally in the States, it's, um, you know, it's either a Yamaha CP300, which is a digital piano. It's, it's got an action that I love. But that keyboard is a flat shelf-like top to it. So I could put another keyboard on top of that right. directly. And um, so a lot of times it's just those two as controllers. The other one is Yamaha's new uh, YC61. It's a, it's a mm -hmm. Hammond organ kind of thing. It's, I think they kind of went after Nord a bit on that because yeah, the yeah. interface is very similar to that. But it's got waterfall keys, which is great for B3 yeah. stuff. And there's just enough room then to put my laptop and then I have the iPad on a mic mount, mic stand mount. Um, but the other version of my rig uh, if we're doing a bigger thing, um, I'll take out like a Roland Phantom, uh, Phantom Seven, uh, or Jupiter X, and then sometimes if it's if it's like a video shoot or something big, I like having like the System Eight off to the side. Uh, it just depends depends on the show mm -hmm. and and so how much truck space I'm allowed. <laughs> I saw quite a few of your performances live that were using some Roland keyboards, like the. I believe it was the Phantom and uh, was it RD something? Yeah, the RD2000. Uh, so you're, yeah, you're, so you're basically using those as controllers and then the consistency comes in that you're using your main stage rig? Yeah, yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah, I don't know if it's great to say out loud or not, but it is what it is. I, all my sounds come from, from the software. I mean, now I do have at least one of the keyboards wired in, so God forbid if something would happen to the laptop, it's just a quick volume smart boost, yeah. you know i can honestly th say though i've never ever needed to do that um you know a lot of guys are afraid to use laptops live but i think if you really set it up right it they're bulletproof i mean it's it's as much as any keyboard is uh mm -hmm. at least in my experience knock on wood um <laughs> but yeah I, i've had a i've been doing it for at least 20 years using soft synths on on stage now back then I would still have a rack full of MIDI modules, you know, like a JV 1080 and, and a, you know, piano module or something. But um, yeah, it's it's been great for me. Uh, but most maybe, of the time, maybe, the keyboards are just controllers. Oh yeah, and maybe this is a good time um, to to ask this question. So, COVID's over. A lot of people are getting back to gigging. Maybe there's. Uh, you know, a number of people that have, you know, been really working on their stuff and they're, they want to get out and gig, but have never gigged before. I know Ben gigs all the time. I made a living at arranging and, and, uh, playing live for, for over a decade. You've done it for 20 years and for like a, a stadium level act, uh, with, uh, Michael W. Smith. Uh, what kind of recommendations would you have for, for players that are, are beginning to get out of gig or getting back to gigging in 2021 that will help them as far as equipment set up? Um, uh, like you were just talking now about having a, a setup which allows you to switch if something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I incorporate a lot of stuff with my with my pedal boards the same way, like I can bypass certain certain sections that if something goes down. Mm -hmm. what, what are your top tips and tricks that you've learned from the last uh, 20 or you know, 20, 25 years of, of gigging? Well, um, I'd say this back in the day when, when before when I was using a laptop, I used to have like, I wish I had a picture of it, but there's a, I think it was a 20 space, you know, big shock mount rack. Uh, there was a Mac G4 rack mounted in it or, mm -hmm. or something of that variety at the time. Yeah. Um, so a tower computer. So the big thing back then was an uninterruptible power supply, mm -hmm. um, battery backup, which even, even with a laptop rig is still a smart thing if you're doing a higher profile show. 
most guys, you know, but I'll say this, somebody one time brought over, I forget, I think it was a Korg, I forget what, what the model was. It was one of their big workstation keyboards with a big screen. This was maybe six, seven years ago. And they turned it on. It was a solid minute before that thing was ready to play. I, could, I couldn't believe that. I'm like, <laughs> I'm so used to keyboards, you turn them on and they're ready to play two seconds later. So the first thing I thought about that was there again, even though that wasn't a computer-based rig, that keyboard is a computer. So if you're in an act where, you know, God forbid something, somebody trips over a power cable or something and your keyboard takes a minute or, or so to boot and load its samples or whatever, I still think that's a good idea. So, you know, having good power is, is big. Um, having some kind of redundancy, you know, with your rig. Um, I think most big touring acts probably have, you know, if, they're, if their show is dependent on a computer, they usually have two identical systems set up mm. with a switcher that, that switches instantly. I actually have never done that. I think people think I'm crazy for that. But <laughs> um, again, I think, you know, it, when I, in my backstage past documentation, I put a whole chapter in the PDF manual about how to set up a laptop rig and how to optimize it for audio and MIDI and playback. Because it's not hard. It's just a matter of knowing where to look. And there's some things you can do under the hood um, at the OS level to really make your computer uh, optimized for that. So I think that's that's a big part of it is knowing how that stuff works. Um, now, and just, just, sorry, just to, to interrupt you there for a second, uh -huh. yeah, on, I, I think it was the DX Dreams, or I don't remember if it was that or the Backstage Patch, but you were talking about um, you'd also provided uh, some uh, like codes for the terminal or something to help optimize the computer. Yep. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. That's it. Yeah. All the manuals have that stuff in. I, I copy and paste that into every new manual because most guys don't know that stuff. I just have learned it the hard way and, and um, collected all that knowledge over the years. And I, so I, I just, that's something I like to give people as a bonus that just says, Hey, if you're going to do this, here's how to do it right. Here's how to do it in a way where your rig will be reliable. Mm -hmm. But what I was about to say is you also have to have some common sense. Like if you're going to have a laptop rig, um, another big factor when I developed Backstage Pass was it's all stuff that's very, very CPU efficient. I see guys all the time that will try to load up eight instances of Omnisphere and then they wonder why the computer <laughs> crashes in the middle of it. it you just can't do that. Um, Logic's sampler is, has always been probably the most efficient sampler I've ever seen. It just it loads instantly, even like the big Blair Masters custom piano, that's a 16 gigabyte piano sample and it loads instantly because it's, you know, it's streaming from disc. But um, so I, I'm big on not punishing users with big copy protection schemes or whatever. Like it, people are gonna crack stuff. It's just reality and I hate it. And, and now that I've kind of dipped my toes into being a developer, now I really understand how it hurts. Um, but I'm just big on make it as easy as possible for the end user to load up your stuff and enjoy it, you know? And yeah. so, yeah. but I, I always tell people, if you're going to do a live computer rig, um, just be careful what you ask of it, you know? And I, I also, uh, I run stems with logic while the same computer is running my sample stuff in, in main stage. And it's totally fine. It, um, as long as you're, you know, exercising a little bit of, common sense you know you're not loading up big uh cpu hungry sample libraries you know like string like spitfire strings or something that's going to choke any computer yeah. it's not meant for live use you know so you, just knowing your limitations that's kind of a, a big thing um and other than that you know and what it's about the computer though. itself and and how how often do you update that are you some there's a lot of people that are still back on snow leopard <laughs> are, are you keeping yeah. your operating system up to date how often are Ooh. you changing computers to keep the processing power at max uh that's a great question i am one of those and i'm not that far back i'm not on snow leopard but i'm still on mojave i'm on 10 14 6 mm -hmm. um on pretty much all my machines that's as far as i've gone because um excuse me from catalina forward Apple fundamentally changed the way the OS is organized and it broke a lot of stuff. And I'm a cheapskate on, except for when it comes to synths. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm not going to 
have to pay hundreds of dollars just because I did an OS update. Like I, half my software wouldn't work anymore. So I'm just a little bit on the side of, you know, pardon the pun, but not upsetting the apple cart, you know, mm-hmm. just keeping things lean and mean. And, you know, the other thing for me is my whole studio runs off of a MacBook Pro. And um, when I'm doing big film scoring projects, that has to interface with my four other computers using Vienna Ensemble Pro and all these other peripheral pieces of software so i can't afford to take the risk so what i'll do is when a new os comes out i might test it on a on a backup drive just to see if everything still works but i don't i won't make the leap on a working system for quite a while and this is the longest i've ever gone i mean you know here we are with the the latest one about to come out so i will be two major os's behind at that point and um you know, I just don't see any reason to move right now. Everything works. Everything I need works. Uh, so I tend to stay away. They call it the bleeding edge for a reason. <laughs> yeah. And I don't want to bleed. <laughs> so an M1 Mac is not in your immediate future. Uh, no, I, you know, I'm very interested to see where they go with that, whether, whether it's an M1X or M2, I don't think anybody mm. knows yet, but um, I'm anxiously awaiting because the, the only you know, we actually are going to need a new show computer. The, the computer I use with Michael is almost six years old. And right. um, it's crazy to me that all this stuff still runs great on that machine. Um, but the big problem I see with the M series machines is they're all limited to 16 gig of RAM. Mm-hmm. And I know, I know that, the, you know, it's all much, it's handled differently with the M chips or whatever. So that's less of an issue. But when I'm at home, I'm still running huge sessions that needs a lot of RAM. Yeah. And uh, so until they open it up to, you know, at least 32 gig or 64 gig of RAM, it, that's a limiting factor for me right sure. now. Yeah. Well, the next but, uh, uh, MacBook yeah. update should take it up to 32 at least. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm hearing. And hopefully I, I, yeah. I have to think so. What yeah. memory have you got in your uh, MacBook now? Um, the the show machine is uh, it's a 2014. It's a quad core i7 with 16 gig of RAM, and f- for that it's fine. Uh, you know because I'm just running Logic and Main Stage, and I've got a little app. I think it's called. Uh, I, I talk about that in the Backstage Pass manual too. Let me see if I forget what it's called. Um, it's a little memory meter. Oh yes. For some reason I don't see it, but that that always shows that I've got about three or four gig of free RAM, which is kind of pushing the limit, yeah. but uh, it, it works fine. Now my studio machine is, um, it's a 2018 six core i7 with 32 gig of RAM. And it's still plenty powerful. Yeah. 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 Until I'm, until you do video work, then that'll, <laughs> that'll tell you where your weaknesses are. As it does. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's interesting about optimizing things live when you were saying that before, like when I first got main stage, I, I, I think I was guilty of that. I couldn't get me head around. Unless I'm doing something fundamentally wrong, like my set uh, for live is the full show, you know, mm-hmm. like in main stage and you go from patch to patch. Um, but I've had to do it all in the uh, the Apple sampler thing, you know, the mm-hmm. EX, because because of those those uh, you know things like uh, glitching and cutting out and that because you were just drawing too much power. And I did find that it it is really efficient uh, and it's the best way of doing it by far. So you, you I can understand why you've gone down that with the backstage pass. Yeah, but I, I, I've gone as far as like with. With, with what I do, you, you might just have something that's only played in one octave. So mm. I just sample that octave, you yeah. know, to to reduce the strain even further. Yeah. Would, would you recommend that kind of? Or, or, or if you say if you've set up a split and you're only using three notes of a grand piano sample, is it? Is it using up resources, those those still being in the memory? or No. You know, actually, that part of it, I don't think you have to worry about. Because right. um, if you looked at the actual sample content size of, say, Backstage Pass, it's, oh, what is it? I, it's, uh, it's about 16 gigabytes for the whole concert. Right. And you could never load all of that into RAM because your OS needs some of it and, and yeah. so forth. Um and it, like the one I'm working on now, it's 
it's called Model 8591. And it's basically a bunch of synth pianos, it, it, very heavily based on the Roland MKS-20, you know, that was big in the, the mm. late 80s. But there's also some other stuff. That one is about 40 gigabytes. So it's, it's more than twice the size of Backstage Pass. But because of the way sample streaming works, it's only loading the very, that's a very tiny fraction right. of the sounds into, yeah. into RAM and the rest it just streams. It just happens to be that that engine is very, very efficient. So I don't think you have to worry about samples uh, as much as you have to worry about CPU. Um, like with audio plugins, like if you're using, you know, Space Design or a bunch that's a, you know, convolution reverb, um, yeah. stuff like that. Or, yeah, yeah. and I will also say main stage, I have some complaints about it. It's far from perfect. It's a great app. It's kind of like, uh, it's a playground for, for the kind of stuff we get to do, but it's not the most CPU efficient program. And um, I was surprised uh, to find that Apple is using my backstage pass stuff on the test bench because they, they, they actually sent me an email and they said, you're, you're asking it to do things it wasn't really meant to do and you're, really, <laughs> you're pushing it far. So the, the good news is that's helping them, I think, to hopefully create a more efficient version. You know, there's, there's guys that are using um, a competitive app called Gig Performer, uh, which mm -hmm. is pretty popular. And a lot of people have said that that one is way more um, CPU friendly than main stage. And, I, you know, I've, I've noticed that main stage can, you know, it's a finely tuned machine. And um, I'm, when, I, when I'm developing these things, I'm always watching the CPU meter because if it spikes over half, then I'm like, okay, it's time to figure out where I can, yeah. you know, yeah. squeeze a little bit more power out of it. And yeah. uh, it, it definitely has some, some maturing to do, but it's, you know, they're, they're definitely making progress. Hmm. Uh, Robbie uh, mentioned in the chat that uh, he's he's working on his 32 megabytes on his Series 3, but <laughs> you guys are, are really progressive because I've still got these in my library. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes, uh, yeah. How many mega them? <laughs> yeah, how many megabytes are one of those? No, I, I just fitted, um, I just fitted a, a 32 megabyte uh, memory card into the Series 3 that I've got downstairs which is the most that it, that could address and that's uh, and and that board will set you back uh, the thick end of 5 maybe 600 uh pounds for that one board that you know 30 because it's a custom made thing but yes it's is that, uh, is that down to the processor then the actual Fairlight processor that you could never go beyond that it just couldn't handle it or? basically the system can't address more than 32 yeah. meg of ram and 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 certainly in the early days uh, it was less than that you know a, a series 3 generally came with a maximum of 14 megabytes then you could swap it out and, and bump it up a little bit um, but they only made two meg and four meg boards and then slightly later on they made some eight meg boards <laughs> um but then, of course, the, the Series 1s and 2s were operating in kilobytes, not megabytes. And, mm. and yet they still sound amazing. Um, like, you, I, I, yeah. I've wondered, like, 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 why they don't go about it, like, the same way as, like, say, like, SD cards. You know, like, you, you make a computer, one day it's going to have a cut-off point where you can't go above that because it just doesn't support it. It just doesn't mm. support... But, like, it is there no way of of having it so it can just take what's out at the time you know, no maybe we, not those speeds but you know somebody brings out like a a, a seven terabyte stick why won't it yeah. go in my archive yeah. the, the thing is with with memory it's because it's more in, intertwined with the way that the computer works and it's addressable memory and and the 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 you know the hardware the inherent hardware the cpus and that just can't address they weren't built to address anything more than a particular limit and at the time that limit was considered probably beyond the yeah. the, the needs yeah, of the yeah. user anyway yeah. with storage it's it's different because you know we use these um scuzzy to sd boards and it's somebody's just very cleverly you know taken one of these uh small like teensy chips or you know that they can just write a custom program that emulates what the bus was doing so the scuzzy yeah. bus and what the computer sees is an old-fashioned SCSI bus, and then it translates it into a modern storage format. And at the end of the day, storage is just like a bucket. You know, you can have a big yeah. bucket or a small bucket, but memory is a slightly different, more complex thing. But I, I wouldn't know huge amounts 
about all of that. Um, Jim, it's been absolutely fascinating um, talking to you about your your work and what you do and backstage pass. I, I'm starting. I'm going to have to start putting some money away or selling a few things because um, I'm really interested in that. Even though I don't perform live, I'm really interested in the logic aspect of it and the the sessions yeah. uh, for sure. Um, so yeah, um, just so I'll, that everyone I'll knows. Have a look. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So you can go and visit Jim's website at uh, jimdanica.com. And from there, you can access the Backstage Pass site, but it has its own... Uh, I've just realised, completely misspelled that. <laughs> I've missed out the S. Where are we? There we go. Um, so, yeah, backstagepass.store is the address there. But, of course, you can access di directly from, from, from Jim's website. Um, we've got about 10 minutes or so left to go. Um, so uh, thank you, Jim, for all of that wonderful uh, stories and information. There's a couple of things I just want to get out there because they're, they're news items that um, are kind of fleeting. And if you don't cover them now, we'll, we'll probably forget them. But um, of course, there has been some movement on the, the Behringer front, as there has been for the last couple of weeks or so. There's been something new every every kind of day. This was one of them. Um, and this one, as a as a drummer, um, at, at heart, this this one really kind of interested me. This was picked up by uh, um, Tom over at uh, Synth Anatomy. Is that Behringer are currently working on a remake of the Pearl Sing Cushion SY1, uh, but in their well, he calls it the Eurorack format, but it looks like it's you know very much in the same um, cases as the Neutron and the uh, well, those uh, are Cat Euro and all those kind of things. Yes, you can take them out and put them in, but yeah. I always I always worry about these connections that they have at the back there and how they can be accessed. But anyway, yeah, it's it's it, it can go in the case or that. But interesting that they they pick the the pearl sing cushion, which was it's kind of, I mean, I've got some samples of it somewhere in something, but it's not really the first uh, thing that I would have thought of to go to. But then you know, interesting nonetheless. Um, Any, I mean, obviously there's there are no demonstrations of this this is just a uh, uh kind of a first picture of an upcoming remake they say but um lots of kind of classic 70s disco kind of sounds in here i guess i, I can see like well i can only see a, a very very limited market for this they mustn't be bothered about how many they're going to sell because th there is a market for it but it's not like mm -hmm. It's not like the Model D when that came out is it everybody everybody wanted one of those this this is like what well, one in a hundred keyboard players might want it. Uh, yeah. It, it, if that, it, it's it's a bit of a strange choice. It, kudos to him for doing it, but like, it, I I I can't see people like queuing up outside shops getting hold of them. It's one of those things that I think if you were to buy a sample library of vintage drum machine sounds, then you'd expect to see it in there. Yeah. But mm -hmm. as a standalone unit, I mean, sure. 808 clones, 909 clones, yeah. Lindrum clones. Get that, totally get that, because yeah. there's there's a uh, a programming paradigm and there's a, you know a, you know a, an interface that is um, desirable as well as the sounds. But with the syncussion, I don't know. It just seems. I guess there's not a huge market for these kinds of sounds in your world, Jim. Well, it's funny you ask about that. One of the other things that I've got kind of in my back pocket. It's not a secret, but the. Um, uh, just for fun, I want to do a library of all the iconic '80s drum machine sounds: mm. uh, Simmons, Lynn, the Ob, you know, the Ob, what do you call it? Oberheim. Uh, Oberheim, yeah, DMX, 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 yeah. You know, all those those iconic sounds, and it'll kind of complete the whole '80s thing. Uh, mm. And it'll just be purely for fun. But um, and that one's going to be very, you know, it probably be thirty or forty dollars, you know. But sure. all of those iconic sounds in one sampler instrument um so but yeah you you, you have a great point it, that's an interesting one to to do a dedicated hardware piece on yeah absolutely i'll tell you what has um caught my attention this week if we're talking um vintage drum machines is alex ball's video on the M, uh, emu sp 1200 and i mean that the that machine I, I just, as soon as i watched that i thought how much are these going for nowadays? And then I proceeded <laughs> to have a, a, a minor heart attack um, because they're, they're like at least 5,000, 6,000 bucks uh, a unit. And if you have one, you can send it to Dave Rossum, who will 
um, rebuild it, you know, with mo- you know, proper, you know, updated components that will last a lot longer. And he'll charge you that much again just to do that job. But I guess if you've got money and you've got one of those, but yeah, that SP1200 really got me excited. I love the sound of it. But I, I guess that's why, the, is it the Isla Instruments um, yeah. uh, 2400, S2400, which apparently can do all of that and more is, um, is that quite great. Though. So, yeah. so to kind of answer your question, Corrosive Abuser brings up a point and it's, you know, most of the time we're a temple of the 80s here on <laughs> Proceed <laughs> Network. But for, for, you know, other people, I mean, he brings up its Aphex Twin that has reunited the interest, right. or reignited okay. the interest in the okay. synth cushion. So you think, if I said Roland CR78, um, you're the artist that you're immediately going to think of is probably Phil Collins, I would guess. But mm-hmm. you know, for mm-hmm. me, it'd be Radiohead. So mm, right, I mean, there's yeah. all these there's there's a there's a bigger market than just the '80s. So I think that's where yeah. some of this stuff is coming from. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it does. I guess it takes you know a, a modern day act to kind of resurrect some of that kind of the, that old gear that that nobody really has heard of, um, unless you're a geek like us, um, and then bring a whole new market to it. But yeah, interesting to see that one. They also um, have suggested again they do this thing don't they where they say what would you think if we did something like this and then i guess they get a whole bunch of feedback and um they just go ahead and decide to do it anyway um <coughs> excuse me they um have suggested that they might do a clone of the roland sh5 looks as though they've done it well yes i mean it's in there i think that's the the same uh, frame as the monopoly and the the poly d uh, with that short range keyboard but the S- the Roland SH5 was a very very unique sounding synthesizer and if they can nail that I think there'd be a I think this one would be quite uh, attractive mm-hmm. thoughts yeah uh, definitely I- I'd be interested in you'll be in that just, yeah it's just a a unique sounding instrument and for for the type of thing that I, I do, that it'd be quite useful, you know. And but it, I think it's a good move. It's probably the most interesting one to me out, out of you know they did the Monopoly and uh, they did the Poly D. In this form factor, this is the, the by far the most interesting one. Mm, yeah, and Chris, you um you also uh, sh- sent something through to me again from uh, Tom. Uh, at synth anatomy which was this um another sh5 i guess we can call it a clone um which is being made by a company called g storm which is this sh5 um vcf uh for for euro rack yes uh g storm's a it's just one guy but he's been making great modules uh i have the mixer back at it's a I don't remember how many channels it is back there. It's a bunch, like 10 uh, channel mixer or 12 channel mm-hmm. mixer for a Euro rack. And it's, it's fairly small. It's great. His filters, um, uh, our friend Aaron uh, from Imperfect uh, uses yep. a lot of his filters. And he's just making some great classic, uh, you know, like Korg and ARP and, and sequential type filters and now it looks like this is going to be the next one which was just interesting on the timing because he's been working yeah. on it for a while and then Behringer announced that and so he I guess he decided to show this as well and for somebody yeah. that likes some of those iconic SH5 sounds uh, the kind of older Roland stuff this might be a way to get at it so like I probably wouldn't buy the the uh, full Behringer one because I'm just not as invested into the older I like the early 80s rolling sounds better mm-hmm. uh but you know for me like if i wanted to get you know just a little bit of that vibe with this filter looks pretty cool because it's got um you know multi-mode filter i think it was yeah or do it's a, it's a dual filter with a you know low pass high pass uh band pass and the band pass has separate controls and you can mm. uh, have one or the other or mix them so it looks like a great little module yeah Jim, have you been bitten by the uh, Eurorack bug? Have you gone down that path? <laughs> nope, because I feared that <laughs> if I started down that path, I would never get anything done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it, you know, it's intriguing, and it's I've seen some really awesome setups. But um, 
you know, I, I went through a, a little thing in the last, over the last year, I guess, of getting to the point where I had everything I think I wanted in my studio, you know, a whole bunch of different synths. And then a couple months went by and I'm like, okay, well, what am I actually using every day? And what do I really need? And, you know, asking myself about efficiency and, and um, you know, using hardware versus software. And I just, I thought, I wanted to streamline a little bit. So I, you know, sold a couple things off and I'm down to a point, I think, where every single piece in here is something I, I always am going to use. And um, I'm also out of space. I think my wife is very happy about that. <laughs> um, no more boxes showing up on the front porch. There, there, <laughs> there's, there's only so much. There's only so yeah. much time. There's only so much space and so many inputs on a console and and um, I guess the bottom line for me comes down to there, there are no sounds out there, I think, in that world that I can't get with something I already have. Sure. So I'm yeah. trying to be a little bit of a better steward with, you know, with resources and time. But it's awesome. I mean, more power to people that are into it. I also, yeah. I do think I really struggle with OCD. I can't stand patch cables. <laughs> so, I hear you. I hear you. I do I'm tripping over that. stuff. But, yeah. Well, one of one of the things that like uh, so both Aaron and I do is like I'm not really big into you know big modular setups. I like a lot of the ambient stuff that's made with it, the generative stuff, but I don't really make any of that stuff. Again, I I just don't want to dump all the time into that. But uh, like last night, I was moving some stuff around since I was I was working in here with the summit in uh, the living room. I just took out my uh, Waldorf KB37, which is like a you know, it's a keyboard controller that has a Euro rack panel in yeah. it. But then I keep a mo uh, usually a Model D in there, some filters, and, you know, a few other things to go along with it, VCAs and stuff. And then I took my cat out with it and and had a, and some other, I have another small Euro rack, um, uh, like, uh, case, which has, uh, like, a clouds and uh, the Polyvox filter in there. And so not really running it to do modular stuff like what you think of like you see a lot of modular videos online but to use it as a monosynth that then is uh, is a modular mono monosynth is how i would describe it like okay i've got a model d and a cat here but then i can switch in the polyvox filter or or the jupiter 6 filter and and so it gives me a little more uh, flavors. I can get some in-between sounds you can't get. Or same thing with the Matriarch, which is I, I use the same way. So that that filter on the Matriarch sounds good, but going through the Polyvox filter also, or you know, instead, is really cool. And then I'm not doing anything that's really outside of playing a mono synth, but I'm able to bring in different flavors for the tone of it. Mm. So there you go. Um, we've got some choices, I guess, when it comes to uh, SH5 clones and. Um, yeah, more power to those who who are, are building them. You know, it'd be interesting to see um, how that Eurorack module sounds uh, as and when it comes. Um, I think they their store is on Reverb, so I think that's where you go and buy that one. But it's not up yet because it's still in development. Yeah. A couple more things I just want to squeeze in before we we say goodbye. So um, the first one is this thing, kind of a segue from the the Eurorack talk. Noise engineering, who are known for their modules, um, are now making some plugins. And uh, if I just bring this into the stream, there we go. Um, there's a, a few VST plugins, a couple of instruments uh, in there. Vert, is it Verior? Sync Verior? I don't know really what, what the names mean. I'm sure somebody will tell me. Um, but they are interesting little plugins, two synths and an effects, uh, and they're all completely free of charge. Um, they're, they're in beta processing, uh, beta stage of development. Uh, compatible on uh, Windows and OS X, uh, even on M1 processors as well. Um, but uh, I, I had a quick play with these uh, last night, actually, and it's a, it's a really nice, very simple kind of um, UI, um, which has this kind of flame effect, which I, I've since discovered is configurable. You don't have to have all of this stuff going off in the background. Mm -hmm. It can just be super simple. Um, but it was you know, just flicking through the presets. It sounded really um, quite nice. Did any of you guys get a chance to to play with these? Yeah, I, I downloaded them and had a go. It, it, it's very very basic, isn't it? it, it mm. it's, but you you can get some interesting stuff out of it. 
I was just a bit frustrated with the envelope. I, I wanted two envelopes, but yeah, <laughs> uh, that that was it. But yeah, it, it's free. It's superb value for money, and well, yeah. uh, get get it because what, why not? <laughs> why not? Yeah, uh, and that that flame effect, it, it, it's okay for about five minutes, and then you've got to turn, you just it, turn off it, it off. Start, <laughs> starts doing your head in, but like, yeah, it, it, it it's good. It's yeah, you know, it's good. Did you have a chance to look at these, Jim? Or no? Yeah. Um, but the last couple of days, somebody was telling me about the Cherry Audio stuff. Oh and, yes. Um, so I was like, how good can it be for twenty five dollars or whatever it is, thirty five? But that their their uh, mon- what do you call it? Memory Moog. Memory, Memory Moog. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was really impressed with that. Yeah, it's good, and isn't it? Especially, you know, I threw a um, a Neve 1081 on it and boosted the low end a little, and then it really came to life. So, I mean, regardless of price, I think it was really cool. And their their ARP 2600 is cool. But the other one that really blew my mind the last couple of days is uh, Soft Tube, the Model 72. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. Mini Moog. definitely. Yeah. I have, you know, I've never had an, a real Mini Moog. I've played them, but. Um, I've had the Behringer, uh, the Poly D, which I've loved. It's been phenomenal. I'm going to sell it. I mean, that that soft tube is so good. Have Have you played the Model 84 yet? Uh, the Juno uh, emulation? Yeah. No, it's... because I have so many other Junos. Already. Like I've, the System 8 to me is so spot on. But I'll check it out. I just don't have the yeah, need for. Let me tell you, I, I have so I have an original Juno that's uh-huh. well, it's in the closet. But and I have a System 8. And uh, I mean the Ju- the original Juno is the original Juno, right? It's great. Right. But the Model eighty four, uh, I think it cleans the clock of the System eight and the Rolling Cloud. It's really, it really good. It, the, only, okay. the only bad thing about it is it's a single envelope, just like the uh, original. Yeah, right. And I really liked having the second envelope to do it. Yeah. <laughs> it made it a lot yeah. more versatile. Yeah. Well, I'll check it out. I mean, I, that's a sound I can never have too much of. I, I love. I'm a sucker oh, for yeah. that Juno thing. So. Yeah. Cool. Well, there you yeah. go. That's noise engineering um, with some free plugins, which are always uh, very welcome. And you just go to noiseengineering.us, go to their blog, and you'll find uh, those as down free downloads. Very simple process. Just sign up with your email. It was and, something and that I, I noticed on those. I, I the tone was really good on them. Mm. Uh, the distortion plugin is crazy. It's this is not like your tape saturation or anything. It's if anybody knows what like a Zvex uh, fuzz factory is, it's on that level of crazy. Right. But the synths are the synths are uh, really great, also. And but I did notice that they don't have. Uh, I, I wish it had an extra envelope, like Ben said, but they don't have a velocity control for the amp. And the thing is that the sounds are very velocity sensitive. So um, I had the Summit Sin on here and was trying them, and I was like, man, I'm just it's all over the place, crazy in volume, you know, also in volume spikes. Mm-hmm. And I, I swapped out a couple different keyboards and played it from the X key and the Cobalt, and it was a little bit better. But that's one thing I noticed, like, if, if you guys try them and, and again, they're free, I recommend it. Uh, watch out for your CPU. <laughs> they go crazy. <laughs> and then also velocity. Make sure your velocity is high on it or else the sounds aren't going to sound right. Sure. Good advice. Yeah. Um, so last <clears throat> last thing, I just want to uh, squeeze this one in. We weren't going to talk about this tonight, but then I wasn't going to be on the show. Now I'm on the show. I'm going to say, stuff it. I'm going to put it in at the back end. So you, some people have actually been talking in the chat about what's this oscillator thing going in the background. Well, this is the... The Essence FM, which is something that myself and Chris have been really uh, excited about. Um, They have just released um, an update to the firmware. When they do firmware updates, they don't do it by halves. And I'm just going to play you this because uh, this this one and a half minute video will kind of cover everything uh, that you need to know. Let me just pull that out of the way and hit go. So now we've got morphing, or shall I say crossfading, I guess. It doesn't actually morph the settings, but it just moves like a vector synth, really. But it's all done on the touch screen. And you can do it manually, we can set it to an LFO, which is what I've got going in the background there. So that can make for some, for some interesting tones, say every uh, aspect of that can be controlled on screen, or via the hardware controls on the unit itself. 
But there's more. There's an XY controller within the mod matrix now. So you can assign it to different uh, aspects there and then just use, use your fingers to uh, make some wonderful FME sounds. Fallback distortion in the waveform editor is another update. Um, more accurate waveform selection with the, uh, the hardware controls. Uh, ratios and frequencies are now displayed on screen uh, on the operator section there and this wonderful seamless transition um, feature that uh, was just very quickly shown on the screen um, really really useful stuff and it's a free update for, for all Essence FM's Mark 1 and Mark 2 Chris I understand you've, you've not really had a chance to play with this yet but um, what do you like do you like the look of that yeah the uh, Crossfading vectors, not really something I need. I think the XY in the mod matrix is more interesting, and mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, foldback distortion will be great. And also, they did just like a, this is such a small thing, uh, but changing the delay to have uh, a resyncable, yeah. yeah, that's a big deal. That yeah, that that's something that makes it a lot more useful as an effect. So yeah, it's um, I'm just trying to call up the list of changes. It's an extensive list. I mean, they don't do things by halves when they do the updates, mm -hmm. and it's really good to see uh, a company, you know, a small company like this. Uh, let me just. I hope I've got the right. You know, uh, and we were talking earlier uh, about you know the DX synthesizers and and. And I've I've really enjoyed the Essence FM, and the thing for me is like you can can start with a sound that is is you know very good um you know you can start with something simple and add effects and make it really broad or, or modulated and that sounds great you can do things that are you know completely like my first two patches on it was one was a very that sound like a handbell choir if you've ever heard one of those yeah and what was that, well that sound and then the second one was this like big uh, almost like analog synthesizer type that filter swept pad mm -hmm. and it, it, it's i'm really impressed with it so far it's very versatile i must say when, when when you see a firmware update when you see that you know the bug fixes are just you know just a couple of little bug fixes because there's not really much that's wrong with it and this massive new feature list of all these different things that they've added in there it's always very encouraging um so yeah there you go um hey Ryan, yeah can that take uh sysx files from like a dx Yes, it can, but it doesn't translate them particularly well because it has a slightly different structure. Okay. So you can take a sysx file from a DX7 and, and throw it in there, and sometimes it's pretty close to what mm. the, the sound was. Sometimes it's not so close, uh, and that's just purely because this has got way more going on sure. uh, in it. Yeah. But um, you know the, the beauty of, of this over you know things like you know six op FM or even eight op FM uh, that you find in in more recent machines is that this is completely freely assignable operators. Mm. You can put any operator into you know you can do any configuration. You're not limited to mm -hmm. a fixed number of algorithms, uh, and so the, the the variety you can use, and it's got filters and and all this kind of stuff um, that you don't normally have, but. The wonderful thing for me is the touch screen. You know, yeah, it's it's what makes uh, it's the 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 easiest and most pleasurable FM programming experience that I've yeah. certainly had. And I think uh, you know Chris would agree. I think uh, Manny and Simon in the chat room have also got these. Uh, would agree that it just really does make it. So you don't enjoy programming a DX7 from the front panel? Not particularly, <laughs> no. But you know, then that's why we have uh, software editors nowadays, which makes it a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think, you know, I mean, programming a DX7 from say Dexed, you know, the free yeah. uh, emulation, it's just great because, you, yeah. in fact, I don't, I tend to program on that without it connected to a DX7. Then once mm -hmm. I've got the sound I wanted, I can then just throw it across, right. and you know, it's it's ninety nine percent there. So yeah. Um, but yeah, that's Kodomo. Um, that's the Essence FM five or version five uh, firmware, which is uh, five point two now, um, because they just uh, tweaked it a little bit. So some really nice, cool things going on there, and some great stuff um, from them, and more stuff coming from them in the future. That is everything. So, um, Jim, 
thank you so much for coming on and for thank staying for, for the for the full show uh, i know it's a long haul but um, i hope you enjoyed that and we certainly enjoyed having you here yeah, thanks um, for having me it's fun come back we'll get you back on again sometime soon um maybe when you've uh, got the 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 next library app for for backstage pass uh, let us know we'll um, we'll get you on you can tell us all about it sounds good anything um have you, i mean are you getting back to live work anytime soon What's, are you, was sorry, that for me? I, I yeah, lost. sorry. Yeah, are you getting back to to live work anytime oh, yeah. soon? Um, we've done a couple shows recently, and we okay. have, as of now, um, starting in September, we pretty much are out for the rest of the year. Um, oh wow, cool! Big. I think the tour that we were supposed to do last spring got basically re you know rescheduled, and they added some more than a, a Christmas symphony tour uh, with with Michael and Amy Grant together. And okay, but you know, I'm I'm kind of curious with with things looks like stuff is ramping up again with this delta variant or whatever mm. and hoping that that doesn't shut every you know shut everything down again but yeah we will see fingers crossed yeah. well, any great it's great to have you thank you ever so much for joining yeah, us uh chris um anything fancy you're gonna you're gonna do anything else to the studio now is it all done uh, you're gonna just get yes, back to working uh, in it yeah pretty much all done so i, I really got to catch up on doing some synth programming and if we can get the next next one out in a little bit then then the, the things will be wide open i uh you know we would like to continue to work on the 2600 uh but that'll have to wait for a little bit mm -hmm. uh, so i've got lots of things planned but just got to work through them one by one indeed indeed and so ben um mm. you are playing live next friday so you won't be on the show no no I, i'll i've missed the first one ever I know, uh, and it's uh, it's Doty as well, isn't it? I was. We I have Mark Doty next week. Yeah, yeah, I was looking forward to chatting with him, but uh, unfortunately, I've got to miss it oh. because I'll be. What time do you go on stage? But uh, usually about nine. Yeah. So, so what's the problem? Why can't you do the show? Um, I won't you, be in you, the house. <laughs> you just just yeah. You, haven't you got roadies that set everything up, and you know uh, you can just no. kick back? No, have we? Yeah. We haven't oh. even got a singer that sets anything off. <laughs> <laughs> Singers uh, never do anything. They've, 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 they've been microphone. You have a robot, don't you? I mean, that's what yeah. yeah. it's for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he is. Uh, he, he's quite good. To be fair, he does all the lighting, um, and and he's not bad, really. I, I'm being unfair. He does do. His, <laughs> he's, he, so, he does do more than his singer's share of setting up. Let's put it that way. Well, I fell. I fell out with a band, or should I say, I fell out with a lead singer of a band because he told me that I didn't do my fair share of you know of lugging of gear and setting gear up I'm the drummer I had like an eight piece drum kit <laughs> with all you know, and and he still wanted me to set the lights up and all he did was come in one guitar one amp plonk it down plug the cable in put his feet yeah. up and start talking to all the ladies yeah <laughs> and he thought I was the lazy one <laughs> go yeah. figure anyway Wait, you were uh, a drummer and you showed up to gigs <laughs> yeah, but like you know, five minutes before we're supposed to go on. Yeah, um, I, I um, might, yeah. I might call in. I'm getting a few comments in the. Um, like my timing, I was always chat. late. Yeah, yeah, yeah do so. so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, do what I did. You know, and come in. Yeah, you know, we'll we'll grab you in live because we're going to have Dominic replace you, just yeah. temporarily. He was going to come and do tonight, but we gave him the night off. But yeah. Dom Dom's agreed he, to come in and stand in for you. Will oh, he grow the beard and uh, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah fill we, in. Yeah, we, we have to get him one of like a Father Christmas beard. Yeah, yeah, just Excellent. get some cotton wool, stick it on. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so in case you hadn't uh, realised, because we've just been saying, um, we have got the wonderful Mark Doty uh, on the show next week. Uh, we've managed to snare him at last. He works with Buchler. He's a synthesizer historian and demonstrator of some repute, uh, and he has opinions. And we, we're going to absolutely love um, chatting with Mark next week. And it's the day after my birthday, and this is actually this is my birthday present to myself uh, to get him on because he's an old friend. I haven't seen him for a few years in in person, but uh, lovely to get him on. Um, we've got a whole bunch of um, of other great people lined up. In fact, we've just lined a few more up. We don't have uh, graphics for them yet, but let me uh, tell you that after Mark, so we kick off August um, with David Bessel, uh, who is one quarter of um, uh, electronic supergroup node along with uh, the likes of flood ed buller 
and Mel Wesson. And Mel's actually going to join us at the end of August. So we've got Mel on as well. Of course, Mel Wesson not only is part of Node, but works a lot with Hans Zimmer and uh, has done a huge amount of work in that field so uh, yeah we're going to talk to both of those guys in sandwiched in between those very nicely we've got mark reader on august 13th um and mark was factory records guy out in berlin in the 1980s and set up and uh, kind of not single-handedly kind of invented the trance movement but certainly championed it over there at the time um so he's going to be coming on and then also august 20th we're going to have kent spong start his regular monthly appearances on the channel which we're really really excited about and we're going to start asking you to think of your technical questions because kent spong is the synth tech to the the stars the rich and the famous um and he's uh he's very well versed in all of these things if you have a particular synth problem something you might want to fix or something you might want to update think of those questions then we'll be pulling those um so that we can start throwing those because we'll have a little kind of kent's repair corner to the show um so we'll throw that in there september um we'd already announced that on september 10th we've got mick mcneil ex of simple minds he's coming back on the show um and i've been thinking of loads of questions because i was listening to a lot of simple minds just lately uh so i've, I've been thinking lots to ask him because last time he was on which was like really the, the beginning of when we started doing all this we didn't have a great internet connection all this kind of infrastructure that we have today so i'm really looking forward to get him I'm back on Axel Hartman, September 24th, designer of the Hartman Neuron and many, many other great uh, pieces of electronic music hardware. He's coming on September 24th. And I am so excited to announce this one. We have got the um, the composer of a number of Bond movie scores and uh, I forget some Stargate. of the other movies. Stargate. He's done the Sherlock Holmes. He's done Little Britain and all that kind of stuff. The one and only Luton's finest, David Arnold, Grammy Award winning, Ivor Novello Award winning uh, composer. He's going to be on the show September 3rd. David Bloody Arnold. Uh, I am so excited about that one. So uh, loads of great people coming up. I'm going to ask him for some tips for the new Spitfire competition. (laughs) Yes, I keep meaning to have a go at that, but I think I'm going to run out of time. But yeah, so please do um, subscribe to the channel. Hit that like button now. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't, and then do hit the bell uh, to make sure that you get notified of our um, impending broadcasts, which are every week, same time, same place. And we do occasionally throw out some random stuff. I think I might, because I've got the next two weeks off work. And if I'm having to self-isolate for the next three or four days, I might do an impromptu demonstration of all the new features of the Essence FM, mm-hmm. if I'm feeling that way inclined. Nice. Um, maybe Chris and I could do something together. I don't have to set yeah. something up. Sounds yeah. good. Cool. Okay, so um, yeah, hit that bell, and then when we do that stuff, you get notified. And uh, if you want to join us, you can. Other than that, we'll be back same time, same place next week. Uh, Don't forget, you can, of course, find us uh, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, all at this, at ProSynth Network. Uh, Don't forget to visit Jim's website, uh, jimdanica.com. And if you're particularly interested in Backstage Pass, the correct address this time is www.backstagepass.store. And you can get all the information by the Backstage Pass and then all of the, the libraries that go with it there as well. And of course, if you want to donate, it's just there. There's a link in the description too. Um, Thanks ever so much, Jim, again, for joining us. Uh, It's been absolutely great having you on. Thanks, guys, um, for your support as always. And uh, we will see you same time, same place next week. I think that's all. Take care. (laughs) Bye-bye. One.